All right. Hello, everyone. I will get this party started. Uh, I actually uh, usually do like a monologue and I'll talk for 20 minutes or so. I think I'm going to talk a much uh, briefer amount of time. I wanted to get some feedback from everyone. So um, I'll invite you now, if you would like to speak, you can. Um, so if you would like to get your word in, you can already start to request that. And um, I guess what sparked this is I, I've been just thinking a lot about the issue of the alt-right. And I would say the alt-right writ very large. I'm not just referring to the movement that I was associated with 2016 and 2017, or I guess it goes back, let's say 2015 to 2018. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the alternative media um, writ large, but I think there's a, a, a right-wing component to a lot of it. Um, and the de- first off, the degree to which it is, you know, I guess you could say with exceeding charity, anti-intervention or something like that, But let's be honest, the degree to which it is pro-Russia and pro-Putin, why is that? Why is that an instinctive response by so many? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? It's definitely not a minority. I think it's a majority in my mind, and it might be a large majority. Why is their instinct to, you know, apologize for, root on, sympathize with a the the russian cause and and putin in particular and there's also another kind of tricky issue which i wanted to discuss publicly and that is the degree to which russia has been for a long time now been pursuing a strategy of promoting alternative voices, the alt-right, alternative media, whatever, and viewing this as something that ultimately serves its ends, Um, whether that be a general demoralization of the country, whether that be, you know, I guess, you know, benignly kind of, you know, an alternative view of politics and, um, and in, in kind of worse in some ways, a, uh, a a stridently anti-NATO view, um, one in which, you know, any action by another, by another country can be excused with a kind of whataboutism, you know? So it's like, how can you even condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine because of the Iraq war or something like that? It's really not an argument. (laughs) It's a non sequitur. Uh, and so on. But I'll give a, I, I, well, I'll, I'll mention one thing and then I'll, I'll give a little bit of my personal story and then I can bring in people because I, I would like this to be more of a AMA style thing today because there, there's just so many threads that I could go down and follow. But um, I am in my early to mid 40s, as you know, I was born in 1978. And I graduated college in 2001. And uh, for what it's worth, I was actually uh, in New York City during the 9-11 attack. I um, witnessed it. I looked upon the burning building. So this just, is just to kind of give you a, uh, you know, idea of where I'm coming from. When I, this was certainly in the internet age. Um, But it was long before social media and long before like the social media environment we have now where social media, YouTube, Twitter is driving the news cycle. Um, But after 9-11, you know, a lot of a lot of confusion, a lot of, um, you know, the reaction to it was largely patriotic among the country. But that quickly spilled over into Someone's got to pay in the Afghanistan war and the Iraq war. I oppose both in my very limited capacity. I, I was a student at one point. I was at University of Chicago. I was a school teacher 
actually at that time, uh, very briefly as a school teacher for one year. And, you know, to the degree that I had any voice, this is obviously before Twitter, before live streaming for all this stuff. I, I was actively opposed to these things. Um, and I, I think I genuinely saw American foreign policy as deranged. You know, I was a Cold War kid and I can remember the Cold War when I was in and I was, uh, you know, it ended when I was about, uh, say, 10 or 11. And, um, you know, at that time, I didn't have much real, any real question about American foreign policy. I was born after Vietnam. Um, and it was, I had a kind, you know, was, again, I was a child. I had a view of, you know, the Soviet Union is a dangerous entity. I don't want to live there. Um, it's totalitarian, it's oppressive, it's brutal. And, well, you've got to stick up for your own country. Um, as I entered adulthood, I definitely began to bring critical thinking to this. Um, the, uh, the episodes in the former Yugoslavia, which involved NATO, a little bit before my time, those were occurring in the late 90s when I wasn't you know, quite, uh, <laughs> quite having strong opinions about the passing world yet. Uh, but that that was something that I imagine I would have opposed, spoken out against. Certainly the Iraq war in 2003, I was following it avidly um, and I was absolutely opposed to it. And so what, I, what I'm saying is I can understand why one would have a, you know, at the very least skeptical view of anything America does and a kind of anti- U.S. foreign policy view. It's all about the oil. It's all about Israel. It's about the fantasies of these neoconservative ideologues, et cetera. All of those are, are totally reasonable criticisms in my view. Um, I went on RT many times. I was invited to go on RT. Um, they had a, um, a number of different producers I, uh, that I would speak to usually, you know, Russian names, Russian speakers, they'd talk to me in English. And every time I went on, I think, uh, well, most every time that I went on, it was about some American foreign policy adventure. So I would go, I would, they would bring me on to, you know, bash American foreign policy about, you know, Obama's Libya. I would say the Obama, Hillary Clinton, Libya campaign about, the Iraq war, um, fallout, et cetera, about the, you know, an issue in the Obama era was the Syria, the second term, these red lines, what you should do. So I never went on there and spoke about a lot of the things that I was writing about on alternative right.com or Radix. I imagined that the producers knew about the fact that, you know, it was radical, but I would go on. I could probably easily be mistaken for a leftist in the sense that I was I was speaking out against the American empire and its foreign policy blunders. Um, but, you know, you, you kind of have to also think through this. I don't disagree with any of the opinions that I had about those conflicts. I think that I was right and I think my instincts were good. I don't, it's very hard to find someone who thinks that the Iraq war was a good idea. Uh, the Afghanistan war is almost schizophrenic where um, most everyone wanted to get out. Trump promised to get out. And then once we get out, everyone, you know, oh my God, what a, bl you know, how, how could we have pulled out? Or, or at the very least, it was incompetent to pull out. You know, it's, 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 it makes no sense. Um, but I, I think I was right on all those things. But I wonder the degree to which I was being used by Russia in the sense that not that my opinions were wrong, but that I that they saw a kind of advantage in promoting alternative voices that they viewed as effectively pro-Russia, that if you're demoralizing America and you're demoralizing NATO, you are effectively demoralizing Russia's perceived geopolitical enemy. Um, 
you know, again, it's it's a tricky issue. As you can tell, I'm very ambivalent uh, about this issue. But I also noticed that Russia Today issued a missive, or they probably issued it, I think they issued it yesterday, basically saying, kind of denouncing all of these, you know, dissident right Putin fanboys who are talking about, you know, Russia striking out against the gay empire or whatever. And basically saying, we don't care about you. You're harming us, in fact, is what the, the missive said. You're, we, don't, we are not actually fighting for white Christian, the, the white, white Christendom. We're not fighting for the, what you think we're fighting for. We don't like you. And I think that was, in a way, a very honest statement by Russia Today, and which is obviously a Kremlin organization to the extent that it still exists. Uh, They ultimately don't care about anything that I care about. They don't, I want the West to be strong. I want the West to be revived. That's the last thing in the world the Kremlin wants. The Kremlin might find me useful in the sense that I have strong opinions on American foreign policy that they could view as just kind of generally demoralizing. And when I look back at it, I, I, don't, I do have a great deal of ambivalence. I don't like being used. I don't like being played. I don't like being a pawn in someone else's game. And to a very large degree, I think that's what it's about. And it's not only me. Um, the degree to which Russia has been promoting a cut to a certain degree, a mainstream strategy and to a certain degree, an alternative strategy. Um, during the alt-right heyday, you could find Alexander Dugan publishing on his website, tons of pieces that are pro alt-right. This is the greatest thing. It's way of the future pro Trump. What, what did they really want from all that? Were they enticed by Trump's calls to end NATO or, or at the very least demoralize NATO? You know, why, why are we protecting these Germans? They should pay up. You know, basically not seeing NATO as a really important alliance, a force that is directed against Russia, protecting Europe from Russia. Um, did they like that? Did they just like the Trump movement because it just spread chaos? in the West. So just anything that's, you know, I, when I look at a lot of Dugan's, what he supports later, I, I generally think that anything wild and chaotic he signs off on, you know, the Trump movement, 2016, the alt-right in 2017, uh, the stop the steal truckers going in and shutting down Canada for, a few weeks, just anything that generates chaos. Now, that, that's not to say that there isn't some sincerity in each of those things that I described. I don't necessarily, and I support some of those things, I guess, but I, just saying, I, I do think that there are people in those movements, in each of those movements, including myself, with regard to the alt-right, who are sincere and who genuinely do want a revival of the West. But that is not how the Kremlin and Kremlin-connected people like Dugan view it. They view it as a way of spreading chaos in the West. And when you look at their ultimate actions, I mean, at, at this point, it's indefensible to support the invasion of Ukraine. I would never do it. I don't think anyone can really do it. And so what we're left with in the wake of all of this outreach to various right wings movements. Remember, $12 million loan from a mysterious Russian bank to the Front National. I mean, I could go on. There, there are uh, the, the whole entire alt light, um, these people, Pasobiak, et cetera. It, the, the, it is very curious how much just kind of disinformation that ultimately kind of goes back to supporting a Russian aim, these guys are promoting. So they were deep into it. And I feel like at the end of the day, the dissident right, which is kind of like the 
you know, bastard child of the alt-right or this, you know, the dregs of the alt-right. They're just kind of left, you know, basically passively, aggressively being pro-Russian stooges. I noticed one, you know, when I was glancing at Twitter earlier today, I noticed this one meme of there there is a report on a uh a ukrainian refugee woman who uh and i believe she fled to germany uh might be poland i might be wrong but she was she was ultimately raped by muslims in some kind of refugee camp now that is a terrible situation um you know, yeah, sure. On some level, it's it's just the it's a consequence of the the ref the twenty fifteen refugee crisis, and you know it should be talked about with seriousness. I can't imagine someone would wish that upon some you know a woman. Um, but you know, I I actually did get the impression that the dissident right wished that upon her. There was a kind of schadenfreude or like cackling about, oh, look, you're, you, you're now enriched by NATO, you know, i.e. you're raped by a, you know, Syrian refugee or whatever exactly happened. This kind of schadenfreude about something like this that I just find really repulsive. And the people did this. I, I noticed it on Darren Beatty's account because I, uh, uh, someone sent me something. He was tweeting about me a little bit. Um, what what kind of sick freak thinks that that's funny? And why do you think she ended up in a refugee camp where she was unfortunately raped? Why do you think? Why do you think that happened? Do you think she wanted to go to the bright lights, big city of Frankfurt or whatever? Or do you think that she fled a country that was being invaded and bombed by Russians? I mean, I, I just, I, I look at this stuff and I cannot take any of them seriously, A. And I also just think that the amount of just bad character among the dissident right is extreme. And that bad character nihilistic wish fulfillment is at the heart of their support of Russia. Sorry to be so rude. Sorry to go ad hominem. But that is my conclusion looking at them. All right. I'll just leave it at that. Um, if anyone wants to speak, you can hop in. Uh, just send a uh, Just send a request. I um, I did want this to be a um, a uh, kind of AMA style, so you can ask me anything. I do have a lot of experience with um, the alt right and kind of you could say rubbing shoulders with a lot of these forces that I now find uh, quite dubious. All right, guys, uh, there we go. We got one request. Okay. All right. We got another one there. Um, all right, Brendan, yes, you get to speak first. Hi, Richard. Um, How are you doing? Doing pretty good. How are you? Yeah. Yeah, well. Um, so I noticed that the, the Traders Coalition, as you coined, um, mm -hmm. they span a wide spectrum of Western dissidents. And I actually have coined my own word for them just because um, they kind of deserve this, this name. And it includes a lot more than just traitors. It includes useful idiots also, but I call them malcontents. Um, yeah. Because ultimately they're, they're not contented with society and all of their behavior revolves around their misery. So I would always, I always refer to them on my Twitter as malcontents, but they, uh, they're, they're kind of just exist to attach themselves to every thought leader and try to, to lead them down, like to distract him. That's what I've been watching 
over several years is what they do is they always try to steal yeah. the spotlight. And I'm thinking for like the future of, of politics, um, what do you think needs to be done with, with these people to advance anything outside of uh, the two party liberalism? Well, I, I, I think that we need to seriously develop ideas and that though that isn't that wasn't absent in the alt right of old it it wasn't done enough and you know we we had things you know like you know i don't know american renaissance had been around for 30 years and you know we have the richard lynn volumes and so on some of which i published and you know, Radix was an attempt to, 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 you know, do things thoughtfully. There are other some kind of webzines around like that. But there's never really been serious development of ideas in the sphere where you can genuinely tell someone what you care about and what you want. And in my own small way, that is what I'm doing. I mean, I'm out of the spotlight now. I'm not making headlines, doing activism and so on. But what you say about the people who latch on to thought leaders or latch on to someone who becomes popular or notorious or whatever is, is extremely real. And their desire is to drag you down to their level. And it just cannot be tolerated. And, you know, I have a much smaller social or, or not, well, you could say social, you could say kind of intellectual circle. And I like to keep it that way. Um, because when you open up, you start to get associated with and get like influenced by, and you have to ultimately answer for some of these people that don't really have any talent outside of this like extreme you know malcontented whining and and, and i think the dissident right you know because they all imagine themselves as like anonymous you know truth tellers like some is dot type people they, they like the idea that they're these just a grouping of anonymous accounts who you can't verify anything about them personally and so they never have to take responsibility for anything that they say and that they can just kind of exist in a, you know, you know, I don't know, like in, in a kind of Patreon like situation where they just spew out all of this bile endlessly. That is what they want. They don't want anything else other than that. I mean, I, I was having a really good conversation with my group last night and it was like, the, I don't know if you remember this character. I don't, I don't know if he's even still on Twitter, but like Common Filth. And oh, no, I don't remember. That. Yeah. Well, he all he did was endless tweeting about basically like American white girl sluts and how horrible and transsexual and blah, blah, blah. And he became a kind of thought leader of sorts. And at some point he got doxxed and you realize he's like Eurasian. That is, he has nothing to do with the West. He hates the West. He hates, he, he has no real conception of like American women outside of, they don't want to date me because I'm gross. So basically this right wing guy who is a thought leader was motivated purely by resentment. And all of that stuff, it creates this ceiling where all the dissident right really is, is like rampant whining and doomsaying. And now it is a traitor's coalition in the sense that they actively, they, they, act, they think that Putin is like attacking the West or something. They, they think he's like bombed a gay pride parade or something like that in, in, this, in their imagination. And they genuinely think that he's like going to win this and he'll bring about the doom of the, own, their, the countries in which they live. I think they genuinely think this. 
because they're based their soul the soul foundation of their thinking is resentment there is no ambition outside of being like a shit poster effectively and they want a movement like that that we're just stewing in resentment endlessly and, and Russia, there's Russia no even allow them to this outside of just getting away from these people yeah um russia wouldn't even allow them to to ship posts as you say but even with like yeah, the the insult, in jail <laughs> i shared a tweet from right wing watch that um where Nick Fuentes was comparing himself to Hitler and then saying that Hitler was an incel, so that makes me like Hitler. And so oh, he was God. kind of tongue in cheek, but basically they're they're like turning him into their own personal incel martyr. And I have to say that the shit posters seem to think that liberals are all have always been all powerful when they don't realize that the history of the United States is of a lot of it is persecution. Um, the all liberals that created the USA had to risk a lot to fight England and to declare independence. Uh, the blacks had to risk a lot to get uh, freedom from slavery. Uh, I guess the gays with Stonewall had to risk being beaten by cops. So then it's, it's surprising to see the so-called uh, master race act like uh, that resisting doesn't come with risk or that it's unacceptable to to do politics because they might get punched when every other American group has been through the same thing. And that's why they're powerful because they yeah, took exactly. that they won't risk anything. They won't risk putting their face and name to what they, they, they write They're You know, I guess there's a word for that. It begins with an F the other F word. That's yeah. what they are. Uh-huh. You can also call them freaks. They're loser. They're little girly men. They're afraid to show their face. They're oh, oh my god! All right, don't dox me. Oh, if I hear when I hear that from these, first off, these fucking losers have nothing to lose by being doxed. But I mean, they, what are they going to get fired from their like some like crappy job they have? It's probably not going to even happen, to be honest. And. You know, some people get doxxed, you get fired from the bar you work at, like three months later, you get a new job, you know? It's not like you've become famous or something. You've be- At the very most, you've had your little 15 minutes of hate, you know, on social media. And, it, and it, uh, yeah, it never disappears, but it kind of does, it kind of does disappear. But what are these little girly men, what are they afraid of? I mean, a non-rhetorical question. What are they afraid of? It yeah, kind of sounds pop- like they're the F word. It kind of, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, who am I to say? But it kind of sounds like they're weak. That's, that, I don't know. I mean, I, I would never accuse them of that, of course. But it, it just kind of seems like they're a bunch of little weaklings. You know, yeah. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Course. Personally, I want them all arrested by the FBI just because it would do a huge risk to the political uh, sphere. And, it's not, and, you know, getting all the dissident riot arrested, I mean, what would we really lose? You know, I mean, like, oh, no, Indian Bronson's Substack account. Why you, know, be I, safer. you know, we might need to we might really need to consider that without their Substack posting that, you know, could Western civilization survive that? I mean, we really need to consider this, you know, like their contribution to literature is so great that, I mean, it would just be such a tragedy. I mean, yeah, these people are, you know, sarcasm gone now. These people are shit. Oh, and one more thing is I'm, I live in Idaho and Uh there's some interesting races going on. Amon Bundy and independent, uh, the governor and his Lieutenant governor, a little and Janice McEachin hate each other, so they're trying to try to primary each other. Then there's a Steren Beatty guy who's running as a Democrat, trying to take over Kootenai County with precinct committee men, having them sign on Republicans sign on as Democrats, and then try to take over that county party through infiltration. 
So if Nick Fuentes wants to take over the right and Darren Beatty wants to take over the left, I think it'll be the same for both of them. They, they won't be able well, to do on. that. So this is the Darren Beatty from the Trump administration who's running as a Democrat in Idaho? Well, this is, I'm sorry. This is Dave O'Reilly. I got him mixed up. It's, oh, Dave it's, Riley. Yes. Dave Riley. Dave, okay. Yeah. Dave yeah. Riley, who, uh, you know, appeared at Charlottesville. With a secret yeah. reporter. Um, so he's... Mention a kind of example out of infiltrating the left, and it was. Uh, as for me, I just filed. Um, All right, I'm gonna um, NRD. I'm gonna mute you just for a second. There you go. Okay, you can talk in a bit there. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah, Dave Riley is going to infiltrate the left and fail, but it, it'll be an interesting experiment. So he's uh, running as a Democrat now. I thought he was running as a Republican. Uh, like he did. He, he got wiped out in that race, so now he's running for something as a Democrat. Um, so what are they doing? I mean, what everyone can see through this. Yeah, he's trying to pretend to be like, uh, like a Dixie type of Democrat, Dixiecrat, pro pro life and all that in that party. But Idaho Democrats won't put up with it. And as for me, like I just decided to join in. Um, there's a constitution party of Idaho that's mm -hmm. really small, 4,000 people. So I decided, uh, I just filed to run for my Senate District 22 so I can vote for myself. But <laughs> I think, I think, um, yeah, I don't believe in infiltrating big parties. Um, so just think it'll be an interesting election year to watch uh, these guys find each other once again. But I expect them to lose. Uh, I, I expect them to lose. I mean, I, I think a lot of this pro-Trump stuff, I, I think we, we might have seen the peak of it with like Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, the Blake Masters and J.D. Vance, they are not gaining any traction. Um, they might very well lose in primaries. The last poll I saw of like J.D. Vance, he was behind Mandel, who has been kind of like a right-wing activists for a, for a long time and a lot of the you know trump people that jd vance is trying to appeal to don't quite trust him for obvious reasons because he was anti-trump when it mattered in 2015 or 2016 but um yeah i i just i i don't know when when you when you're just trying to trick people and it, like i don't know it's like people can see through that you can't just run as a democrat and like, I guess I would also ask, like, with these people, like, what are they, what exactly is different about them other than, you know, they're kind of like secretly racist or something, or, or in, in the case of Dave Riley, they're, they're like a secret popist or, you know, ultra Catholic or whatever. Like what, what, what exactly are they articulating that's different you know i mean at the end of the day you know like the the american first crowd you know what is what do they have to say about philosophy or policy that is like genuinely different than republicans that exist now other than they'll go on live streams and like say racist stuff well, I think you have mm -hmm. to sort of break out the different constituents, right? You've got the paleos and they've got, they have, they have principles um, like the Buchanan sort of wing. Then you've got sort of the left wing, like the Glenn Greenwald wing, sort of kind of a left wing thesis. And the, they, those, those groups have real arguments, right? But then you have these like goofball you know, whatever re Republican people I think they just want to humiliate Biden. That's what I. That's what I think. Well, I think that's look paleo conservatives. I mean, I like Buchanan a lot. I have my disagreements, but he, he's obviously a really important figure. But I mean, look, I mean the paleos. I mean that I'm not sure that agree to which they're still around. I mean, I, I mean, I guess you can find individual figures, but I'm not sure that's a constituency. I mean, Glenn Greenwald. They like Biden. They like what Biden's doing. 
who the paleo conservatives? Yeah, they're they're. If you watch, well, who um, are you referring to exactly? Well, like Mc, what's the guy? Mc, uh, McConnell, the guy who was with Buchanan, an American conservative. Oh, Scott, Scott McConnell. Yeah, he was saying, oh, yeah. I'm liking Biden. 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 You know, there was some pro yeah. Biden because saying like, oh, he's yeah. cool. He's not going to do no fly zone. So there's an interesting support these, from that. These side. are just kind of like individuals. Glenn Greenwald. I mean, I have no idea what he supports other than look at me. I'm a former leftist and I'm a, now a right wing grifter. Well, he's he he he's pure Chomsky. So if you read Chomsky, that's his that's his philosophy. I think that's um, highly charitable. I mean, I what is there to I mean, over the past two years, like what does Greenwald do outside of run cover for like the Trump movement? I, I am not going to sit here and defend Greenwald. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's, he's a, he's a smart guy, right? Like he's not. He's clever. He's very smart. Very clever. Yes. It's a difference between being clever and smart. I think he's a high IQ person is what I'm saying, but I intensely dislike the him if you haven't. I do too. A lot of people already. do. A lot of people do. But then I think you have a lot of people who just want to see Biden humiliated. Like, aha, like Putin showing him and whatever. Well, yeah, but why? Like, what, what's the point of that? Because they won the Republicans to win. <laughs> well, okay. But like, <laughs> you know, this kind of gets to my point. Like, this is just massive dysfunction. And like, I don't think, I mean, if you go back to the like Russiagate stuff or, or even like the Hunter Biden laptop stuff, I don't think that the Kremlin really believed that Donald Trump was going to beat Hillary Clinton. I thought they saw that as a long shot, which of course it was. And I think they, you know, got a strong impression that he was going to lose in 2020 but they just wanted to kind of like bloody and batter the incoming president. And so it's like, let's hack the servers. Let's also like stir up just total insanity on the right wing about pizza gate and spirit cooking and, and all this kind of stuff. And let's do the Hunter Biden laptop and just, you know, let everything go wild. Um, but I, I think the strategy is to inspire chaos. Like there's no, there's nothing outside of like th these kinds of things. And they see the right wing as a means to that. And I guess the odd thing about it is that they, they see this as something increasingly mainstream. Whereas it, during the Soviet Union days, the Soviet Union would fund, well, you, they, they funded right wing extremism to a degree, but like, the major funding was towards a radical and in some cases non-aligned left. Yeah. So like the, the Red Army faction is paradigmatic. It's crazed Germans who want to denazify Germany by blowing up, you know, <laughs> buildings and newspapers and what have you. And they weren't even like pro-Soviet you know, in some kind of like discernible way, but they were kind of effectively pro-Soviet in the sense that they generated chaos. And, you know, so you can kind of see um, Putin, the Kremlin, you know, doing that of like, let's support right-wing extremism, let's do this. But I think what was kind of remarkable about 2016 and on was that they were doing that in a mainstream way. And so, like, what did they do? I mean, you know, they, they would buy Facebook ads with, like, images of Hillary Clinton, like, uh, arm wrestling Jesus Christ or you know, some weird, some just totally goofy, you know, thing like that. But th that was not you know, they weren't like, fun, you know, giving money to some, you know, right wing terrorist or whatever. They they were actually going mainstream. And you have Paul Manafort, who's, you know, directly connected to a pro-Russian, you know, um, 
uh, Yanukovych, pro-Russian um, Ukrainian president for a time, you know, literally running Trump's campaign and literally changing the RNC platform on, on Russia's behalf in clear directions that support Russian hegemony in Ukraine. And so it's a, it's a kind of like, in, in some ways, what they were doing was going mainstream. I mean, I think in, in terms of like promoting alternative media and RT, I think that was a non-mainstream, fa- that was an alternative media strategy. But in terms of like promoting Q, promoting January 6th, et cetera, that was a, it was a weirdly mainstream influence strategy where the social media and like all this craziness had become the mainstream Republican Party. And it just makes the whole thing like totally dysfunctional. You know, I mean, like if Biden is fighting off a capital insurgency or like people who believe that Putin has invaded Ukraine to stop the bio labs or whatever, like he can't operate effectively. He's got to put out all these fires around (laughs) and he can't have a strong position against um russia and so i mean i can kind of see what they were doing but again it's like the dissident right falling for all this stuff and just thinking to like oh this is so based and great like they need to recognize that these these people that they're fanboying want the worst for your country you live in they they want absolute chaos. I, I agree with you. I, I just want to point out one more thing, and I'll 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 step away. Back in I don't know sixteen seventeen, you you were much more based. I'm, I'm not trying to troll you or criticize. I'm just no, I've noticed a change in your philosophy, whatever it is. You were pretty anti-American. I mean, I must say you were pretty anti-American about that. I think you were pro-Russia at that point. Maybe I'm wrong, but you said a lot of crazy you know very extreme stuff so i've seen a change in you but it seems like you were kind of in that camp then weren't you yeah i mean look um there i don't want to disown um anything that i said because i you know i you know look you evolve you rethink things you and also they're kind of like inflection points where, you know, it's one thing to, um, you know, be like, well, we, we need to get along with Russia. We can't be antagonizing it. And then we, we re-enter a cold war scenario and it's like, well, I live here. You, you know, you've got to, this is where we are right now. And you can't just be a traitor and just, you know, support a foreign power that is in a geopolitical fight with your own country and i think i was also wrong just simply wrong on things um yeah i mean i i think i fell into a lot of the traps of the dissident right um i mean if i'm just brutally honest um and self-critical there's no question that my ex-wife who is a russian ultra nationalist had a large effect on that and I mean, I would add she had access to my Twitter account in 2017 for a time. She mm-hmm. would 99 out of 100 tweets were me were written by me. But, you know, she did do some tweets. You can basically easily discern them through just kind of linguistic analysis. But, um, you know, I don't know that, you know, this, you know, Ukraine is a synthetic country and you know, all that stuff is her. Now I'll, I'll own it and I'll take the, the buck stops with me. I'll take responsibility for it. I do have the right to evolve as a person and thinker. Absolutely. And, I agree with yeah, that. Yeah. And, but like, also I, I think the facts should be known and um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I guess when you're no longer married to a Russian ultra nationalist you start to rethink things uh ahem. uh uh brandon do you want to jump in uh yeah sure um 
so it's interesting that you brought up uh, common filth because I, I mean I remember that individual fairly well. I think I was blocked by him for a, a time period, but I remember what what he was most known for were those um, videos where he would make like compilations of uh, vines and like Tumblr uh-huh. posts, like Vine marathons and Tumblristas, where he would basically like um, I mean he would watch this stuff and he would compile it. And it was basically just kind of the most like cringe kind of weird gender stuff. And he would combi- like compile it. And then he later made, and I have to say that those, those videos were, were fairly entertaining, you know, in my yeah. opinion, but, but, um, you know, but he, he just had like a very libs kind of, of TikTok, Twitter accounts or whatever. Yeah. It, it's like, um, you, you know, he would do that. And then he eventually made, like was selling like bumper stickers that were like that said like white girls fuck dogs or something like that and yeah and he was kind of one of the 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 original people that was like you know trying to to scapegoat like white women for everything like so it's not like these other um these other issues really it's like it's white women that are that are the problem that's that's the kind of thing that he would say yeah you see that um, that is rampant yeah, those, it's rampant, and there's like, um, I see that. So there's so many people that have kind of like, um, like they're they're still, like that's still their their entire content is just. I think there's that one guy who's like, you know, uh, bad Billy Pratt or whatever, like killed yes. a party. His entire thing is just like posting photos, you know, of like well, a kill the party is a reference. I remember that account for a long time. It's a reference to this. Um woman who i believe was acquitted of murdering her children and she uh, uh i can't remember her name at the moment but um she was basically uh, i mean i i remember seeing a um a, a documentary on her case at one point i mean she is a psychopath she's just i mean whether she's guilty or not i don't know you know i won't <laughs> express an opinion but she's clearly a psychopath and a uh, compulsive liar and her children died in mysterious circumstances. And then she never reported that to the police and then began telling all these weird stories and like lying to the police about her job. And like, she took the police to, I think it was like, she claimed she worked at Universal Studios and she like took the police there to do an investigation. And they started talking to people and they're like, oh, this woman doesn't work there. It's just all this just totally bizarre shit. And she basically like, is she's attractive and i guess that i don't know she had a good defense attorney she got off but again this is like you know this is the kind this is like a true crime case where you're like oh in inside the mind of a killer you know thing the idea that like this represents all women or something is just you know a, a complete lunatic thinks that way it's like the reverse psychology of of like people who think you know all all men are are gang rapists or something you know it's just, it's the same craziness and again just now i mean i saw something from these accounts all of these accounts by the way that are getting retweeted by all of these like traitors coalition like the red scare you know those you know ugly women who have a podcast about resentment like i think that's what how we could best describe them and like Amy Therese Ditto, um, and they they basically are like retweeting all these racist accounts, like uh, Second City bureaucrat or like uh, what is it LP Lovecraft account or whatever. And it's all about this. It's like rooting on Russians because they're they're apparently fighting gay pride parades, and um, and then also like the real problem is that women are in charge. And this is what this is this is what our movement's about. It's basically it's not even like a racialist movement at the end of the day. It's a anti white woman movement. And you know, whatever like kernel of truth there might be in this kind of analysis, it's pure resentment. And uh, I, I'm just tired of this yeah. Like I, this is all they want. This is all they want from life is to shit post endlessly about how, you know, women are bitches. 
And it's just kind of like, why listen to any of these people? Um, I, yeah, well, not, not, uh, you know, not, not just that, but you know, the content, even like that, um, that killed the party guy. Like, I mean, his whole thing, like common filth was doing that seven or eight years ago where it's just, his whole thing is just po- like posting, a photo of like a, you know, like a goofy drag queen or something and saying like, welcome to hell, you know? And yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, what else have you got? Like, you can just find these pictures of like, you know, cringe people every and just post that. And it's like, and, and I always hear this, this argument from some of these people and you kind of alluded to it before where it's like, they say, well, like, you know, who, like Putin is just, he's fighting the, the GAE, you know, the global American empire that, you know, the, the gay and all of gay. that. And, and it's like, and they say, they always make the argument that there's not, you know, with Europe banding together, it's not some kind of like a based Europe or anything. It's really like a, you know, global homo or something like that. So that's really what the, the kind of European consciousness is going to be. And I think that there is some truth to that, but what they don't realize is that like so many people, myself included, actually find that preferable to Putinism or um, whatever it is that they're offering. I mean, at least in, in, in the short term, I mean, like, yeah, well, that's you're, true. Da- you're, I mean, you're, you're damn yeah. right that I would take, that I would side with, uh, you know, Bill Clinton or Newt Gingrich, or even like Chelsea Clinton and over um, Cernovich and, and, or Putin and, or some, you know, Marjorie Taylor right. Greene or some of these people. And, I, spend, I agree with that, but and, I don't think you even need to make that argument because what what they also like, you know, you could say that my 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 you know my hot take a few weeks ago was that the world is actually going to quickly become less woke because of this like existential dread in a Cold War scenario. You can disagree with that hot take. Maybe I'm engaging in wishful thinking, but what I am engaging in is the 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 idea that like things can be transformed and like circumstances change and consciousness changes with it i mean you know like germany is rearming now to the applause of the european continent no one's calling them nazis or whatever they're actually applauding it and that strikes me as like actually things can really fundamentally shift and a new spirit can animate a an, a an old vessel and what i get from these people is they don't want anything to possibly change because that would be a real bummer for their grift operation which is basically endless whining about transsexuals and feminist bitch bitches and how everything in the world sucks that is their business. And in a, the, if it's not just their, if it's not their business, it's their hobby. It's their favorite hobby. Some people play golf, other people ship post. And so the notion that like something would change about the world, something would transform, it actually can get better. That is horrifying to these people. Because it, it would be like me taking away someone's golf clubs who's an avid golf club. They'd be like, oh, wait, I can't engage in my favorite hobby. I can't engage in my grift operation anymore because the world's actually changed. And what we've been talking about, like European unity and European consciousness is actually occurring. Holy shit. I don't want that to occur. I will, I actually want more trannies because that allows me to tweet about them. <clears throat> and that's my that's, you know, I mean, again. Am I engaging in like Freudian psychology of these people? Yes. Am I like doing an ad hominem on some level? Yes. But like, I'm also right. This is who these people are. Um, Yeah, you're you're cutting out a little bit, but I just, you know, I just wanted to add to it, you know, kind of getting back to some of the history is this, is that, you you know, you and I are both the same age and, Uh like me and others, I think like online who have been online for so many years involved in this stuff. I think that we've spent a lot of time, you know, writing about and articulating our, our kind of ideal systems and our, our ideologies and things like that. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, we all have our online, your, our projects, our intellectual projects and things like that. But, you know, we also live in the world 
as it is, not just our fantasy ideologies. And there are like realistic choices that we have to make, you know, between different things in the world as it exists, you know, not Mm -hmm. just everyone's kind of, you know, pet ideology or their, um, you know, manifestos and so forth. Like we live in a world as it is. And, and sometimes you have to, you have to deal with that as it is like while you're work, working on these other projects. Yeah, totally. I mean, my kids have to go to school, you know, and I'm not going to betray the country in which I live in and like, wish for its doom or something you know i mean that that is just insane and And i and i also have to take responsibility for things that i say and like if you're just some crazy anonymous shit poster you know you can just deactivate your account you don't have you can just engage in like nihilistic fantasies or basically treasonous fantasies and then just sign off, you know? Maybe the FBI puts you on a list, maybe not. But there's no there's no skin in the game. There's nothing is ultimately at play for any of these people. And so they can just kind of like laugh and root on the demise of their country, even though that's also not happening. I mean, NATO has a raison d'etre again. Um, Europe is coming together over this. Um, Like not everything has to be bad. Not every like current year, you know, thing that liberals are tweeting about necessarily has to be against our interests. And so I, and I, I think it's like this, this other kind of weird thing where it's like, you know, I saw this, this also meme where it's like, I, you know, I support the current thing. So I was pro vaccine. I was pro BLM. I was pro George Floyd or what, whatever. And then now I'm pro Ukraine, you know, because I'm just an NPC. I'm unthinking. Well, I think that's a fair description of a lot of people. You know, they just jump on trends and whatever, what have you. But like, you're no more, or you're, you're rather, you're no less of an NPC if you just, instinctively hate everything that happens or that, that everything liberals like. I mean, I, I have a friend who's French who used to say like, if liberals told conservatives that eating dog, dog shit is bad for your health, they'd start eating dog shit for breakfast in response. You know, you're, you're no more robot, no less robotic and knee jerk. If you just instinctively hate everything that the liberals are fanboying over. Okay, I'll get to some, I think some people are going to highly disagree with me here. Um, before Imperial, I'll go to Bardemu and then Wilhelm Sutton, William Sutton. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, um, I, um, I just wanted to do like a, uh, like a fact check or... Um, or correction because you said that the common field was Asian and he's actually white so uh, there are like pictures common field um, the, the guy we were talking about earlier okay um, he's actually white um, he's not Asian um, because he had like pictures of him um, uh, so I just wanted to say that and um, and yeah and I also think I'm that, sure he was uh, an ugly freak yeah he was uh, overweight whatever. and he's, he had he's white yeah he was Who overweight cares? but uh, yeah um, uh, uh, yeah, I actually thought it was quite funny back in the day, but but he, he never really had any past positive message. You have to take he was more of like a comedian, so you can't really take him seriously. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, but, but but the thing about this sort of about traitor things, I mean, I I think that's uh, um, uh, quite uh, um, exaggerated because you uh, because I don't really think you're like a traitor if you oppose a war. I mean, you can say that about anything. I mean, people who were opposed to the Vietnam War were called traitors too, or or World War One. So, uh, so, 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 I don't really think it's fair to say that any, any, everyone who who is opposed to interventions abroad is uh, a traitor. I think. Well, this is the non-interventionary take, 
all of these, I mean, basing your opinions on resentment and rooting on a foreign power that is aimed for the destruction of your co country, like that sounds like traitorous behavior to me. And spreading misinformation that is, you know, ginning up insanity among, you know, right wing Trump fans and that objectively supports Russia, like that is being a traitor. And so this isn't some war of choice that we're opposing. It's almost like the the Iraq paradigm is something that a lot of these people can't get out of. They They think that like we've created, we invaded Ukraine or we invaded Russia and it's some war of choice in the Middle East or something. This isn't. This is a war of choice for Russia at the end of the day. That's not to say that like a better policy could have been pursued over the past 20 years. This really goes back to 2004 when this was cropping up. I mean, if I were Secretary of State I probably would have tried to reach some deal of like EU. I mean, because again, Ukraine was independent. They voted for their independence in a referendum in like the early to mid 90s, whenever that original thing happened. And to reach some accommodation of like, you can have EU membership, but then we will, you know, sign a, you know, for the next hundred years. Uh, you'll never be a member of NATO so that basically Russia is given that guarantee. Because, I mean, I think I don't think it's even I don't think this war for Russia is even about NATO expansion, like in theory. I, I think it actually is about Ukraine for in uniquely about Ukraine. It's about the prospect of a army, a European army marching across Ukraine to the Caspian Sea as the German army did. And basically that that encircling Russia and, and offering a knockout blow. I, I think that it is a, you know, existential for Putin. And I understand that. So could something have been done 10 years ago that was a lot more sensible? You know, absolutely. But we are here now. And like just talking about this stuff is theoretical. And I'm not even sure the extremely reasonable suggestion that I just made would have been accepted by Putin. I mean, he's also explicitly said like you Ukrainian, we are Russians. Like this is, we're just attacking the Nazis. You know, we we're just, we're liberating Russians from Nazis and we're bringing them back into the family. We net, you know, all of this Ukrainian statehood was just kind of a historical mistake, which, you know, from a Russian perspective, it, it is you know, his invention by Lenin and Khrushchev gave away Crimea, et cetera, et cetera. We never should have allowed this referendum to occur. The Soviet Union never should have fallen. I mean, you can do all these what ifs, you know, I should have asked Stacy to prom when I was a sophomore in high school. Yeah, there's a lot of what ifs in life or you know, shoulda, shoulda, couldas. But we're here now. And, you know, like, they this is not just some war of choice this is a very real thing the world is being bifurcated and russia wishes the absolute worst for all of the countries that we live in and you can see that lead you can see all of that in their actions previously they clearly want that now understandably on some level but this is where we are and like, I don't know. I mean, I, I use this metaphor also in some of these debates that I did. But like, if you're on a football team and the play comes in and, you know, you're like, oh, my God, what is the coach thinking? We're passing on first down or whatever. Or we're running on third down. I can't believe he did that. What's he thinking? OK, you can think that thought. But once you get to the yard, once you get to the ball, you, you need to stop thinking that thought. You have to be resolved. And like, if anyone's not resolved about this, when it's so clear what just happened in Ukraine, the war, their invasion is indefensible. It is inspired Ukrainian nationalism more than any. I mean, there is no chance after this that Ukraine, Ukrainians will ever think of themselves as Russian. 
outside of maybe the Donbass region. You know, and you cannot defend this invasion. And, you know, and the, the, we now are in a situation where we're going to be in a like decades long geopolitical confrontation with Russia and some other factors like China and so on. Like you, you, you must be resolved. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want people, I don't want shit posters in my foxhole. And if someone is going to like nitpick and attempt to demoralize the team, even if they're, even if they're talented, they need to be kicked off the team. I mean, I'm sorry. This is just, this is who I am. I, I don't fuck around with shit like this. And if you are trying to demoralize us, you're a traitor. They don't have any stake in the future. I mean, Angela Merkel might not have kids, but she's a healthy person in society. Uh, she she cares about the future of Germany to some degree. Where yeah. people like Ann Coulter not only don't have kids... But they, you know, they have that outside resentment of mainstream society. And even worse, you, you have people like Nick Fuentes who don't care about mainstream society because, A, they are either closeted homosexuals or something to akin where they don't have yeah. – uh, they, they don't care about having uh, views that are acceptable in society or – or care about basic things like the the hundreds of people that have died every day in this war because they're not well traveled they don't have any connections to the broader society they haven't ever met a ukrainian you know out in a cafe somewhere on their study abroad year because they largely haven't done anything with their lives and and what's really disgusting is you have some of these people like fuentes who uh, say God is, you know, like they, they try to paint themselves as, as Christians, but then they cheer on an aggressive war where uh, it, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It makes yeah. perfect sense in the sense that Christians do cheer on this type of bloodshed against Europeans historically. Okay, shut the fuck like, up. No, no, it's by the sword well, dies. On, sword. We're not doing Let's, a religious thing here. Yeah, let, I, I actually will agree with Salt here. Let's try to avoid a religious war just one time. Sure, just sure. one time. <laughs> uh, Imperial, do you want to speak? Or Salt, do you have anything else to say? Or Well, we'll just, uh, just to finish up, uh, two things. What's your favorite Cold War movie? And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and B, uh, with this whole resentment thing, I think a lot of healthy people they start their journey with recognizing that the problems with society and then that they want to try to fix it. And a lot of unhealthy people that aren't tied into society just want to keep talking about how fucked up society is. Yeah. Um, I, I would say my, my favorite cold war movie quote unquote is um, the audio book of Tinker Taylor soldier spy by uh, John McCarre. <laughs> I, I thought the there's a movie that came out I think in 2011 and there's a BBC um, there's an even better BBC version of it um, the movie that came out in 2011 was really well done um, they changed a few things but I, I think it still kind of I think it still works uh, but yeah I, I, I'm gonna I, I, I really like John Le Carre I, I, I think you know Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy is brilliant and visually, the 2011 movie was was really great. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would probably give the uh, give that the nod of like a true Cold War because it, it's kind of like the anti James Bond, you know, Smiley. He's you know he's got like his wife left him and he's you know down in the dumps. Uh, so he, he's kind of like the you know the anti James Bond. Uh, but then it's also like it's you see the Cold War, it's almost like with John Curé, as opposed to like the Cold War being about, you know, like this, you know, who's going to conquer the globe or whatever. It becomes like deeply personal and kind of part of a personal tragedy. So it's, there's a, you know, great deal of sadness about, you know, the whole thing. So um, I, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great 
it's a hey, great thanks. novel and it, wor it works really well in audiobook and there's there are a couple good versions of it um uh, yeah but i mean like this idea that you have to be an insult to support ukraine i mean it is quite weird coming from people from i mean because from the last few weeks when this whole thing began i saw so much of anon accounts that were posting about oh look i'm gonna get a new based uh, Ukrainian refugee GF. Oh, uh, so, I mean, this is just projection, to be totally honest. I mean, you will have all these people. Well, I saw who, those things, too. Yeah, I mean, they, this is just of... revolting. I mean, that, uh, I mean, like, why would you want uh, like, yeah I, yeah, I mean, you come across as a rape, so, um, if you talk about like, uh, oh, I would like this based 17-year-old uh, uh, trafficked uh, uh, refugee girl from Ukraine, and it's just creepy and disgusting. I agree that that's creepy. Uh, Imperial, do you want to talk? Yeah, I had one question. All right. So back in 2000, what do you make of Putin wanting to join NATO? And he, you know, essentially got denied. Yeah, I mean, I we, we need to figure out like um, I've actually ordered this book uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. I, I really, it's, it's like 750 pages. I'm not sure I'll read the whole thing, but it seems definitive. And I want to kind of get into this um, about what, what, how plausible that was. And um, I mean, the, the way that I would put it is that there, you know, Putin is kind of like a postmodern leader in many respects. And one of his right hand, I'm forgetting this person's name, but one of his kind of like right hand men, um, you know, the Karl Rove of, of him is, is actually a, a postmodernist. And, you know, it, he, it's kind of like, I don't know if anyone can pin down Putin's ideology. He seems to think in terms of like geopolitical structures and i can definitely see him you know in the, say in the 90s where the the outlook for russia was just totally bleak where you'd want to kind of go into the arms of nato much like you know sweden and finland and other places now are who are kind of reconsidering that of of like well we might need to do this we we need that protection and um obviously as someone who ultimately wants a political unification for white people, I, I would, you know, be for that. But I, I think, I think we'd have to get down into the nitty gritty of the degree to which, you know, how long Putin wa was like serious about such a thing. Um, whether that was a kind of a nineties notion. I mean, Putin came to power in 2000, of course. Um, how serious that was taken. I mean, there, there certainly was a degree of, you know, understandable to some extent or to a large extent of animosity towards Russia. Um, there's animosity towards Russia by Brzezinski. There's, you know, it's there and that they just would never accept such a thing. Um, but, and I, and I think it's also kind of an interesting question of, you know, looking at like Putin's trajectory uh, in the sense that, you know, in the Bush era, Putin was viewed as a bit of an ally. Um, he met with George Bush. He, George Bush, you know, looked into his heart famously or infamously. And he was kind of a Cold War, uh, not a Cold War, a, a terror war ally of some kind. Um, certainly by the the time that I was going on, on RT a lot from like 2010 through 2016, that was a time where a kind of neo-Cold War was developing. Um, the original Maidan, the 2004 version of that had, had passed. Um, there was a tremendous amount of animosity between them. It was kind of the days of Pussy Riot and Edward Snowden and this this kind of slow buildup. There was the invasion of Georgia in 2008. Um, there was, uh, you know, I, I think certainly by that time, it, it had been brewing earlier, but by that time, Putin viewed the West as ultimately an enemy. Now, of course, he gave the West to people living in Moscow. Like if you live in Moscow, you can, you know, 
live like you're living in Paris. But, you know, geopolitically and for, you know, most Russians, there, there began this kind of notion of like getting back onto a Cold War footing. And there was a kind of cultural Cold War. There were sanctions, nothing like what we see now for a long time. Um, and this is kind of the fulfillment of that. So I don't know if like that, I mean, the, the idea of like a, a North, NATO would ultimately become like a white military force. It would be a Northern hemispheric military alliance. And needless to say, you know, I find something like that incredibly badass. Um, but, you know, there was probably some animosity towards that among certainly in, in Washington. And I don't know how serious someone like Putin took that. I mean, Putin is just like, you know, so deeply connected to the Soviet Union. I mean, from his early days, he wanted to be a spy. And there's reason to believe that his father actually was a um, operative for the Kremlin in some or the KGB in some way. Um, for instance, when, when Putin was a young man, they had a, a household telephone. Um, that's a bit like having a, I don't know, the equivalent now, like a, a movie theater in your house or something. You know, it, it would, if you know the kid that has a movie theater in his house, you know, you're like, oh, wow, what does his dad do? Um, so there's indications of that. He clearly wanted to be a spy from a very early age. He was a spy. Um, although a kind of B grade one, you know, stationed in Dresden. And I don't know, it might be almost too much to ask for someone like Putin to open up to the West. Yeah, I was young in his, uh, or it was early in his, his reign, I guess, in 2000. I think that's when, uh, he started, so that uh, makes sense that he just didn't have the big picture. But that naive, na naivety was kind of uh, interesting. That yeah, if Russia did join NATO, that would kind of unite the European bloc. Yeah, I mean, at that point, it's kind of like, what do you use it for? I mean, I think I, I've I've used this analogy a few times in in these debates that I've done and so on. But I mean. NATO, it, it is a bit like after the Soviet Union fell, there was a sense that like NATO is this Lamborghini you have in your garage and it costs a lot for upkeep. But it's like, what do we use it for? <laughs> you know, like, what do, what is this thing? Like what? So I think it went through its own identity crisis and I think it was misused in many ways. And um, and I, I just yeah, I think this whole unipolar moment, 30 year unipolar moment. There was an identity crisis everywhere. And I think in, in some ways that's why, not the only reason, but I think it's one reason why the West went insane. And now we actually have a real genuine enemy. And that's a good thing because geopolitical conflict and like major block power like this is a kind of stabilizing force. And conflict is stabilizing, as contradictory as that might sound. And what's kind of destabilizing is that, you know, unipolar moment where there's like, you know, well, who do we fight? Who's our, who are we against? Who's who? Like, it's all it gets very blurry and I think kind of leads to even a kind of dysphoria in a way. Um, I mean, I think the interesting thing now is like, how does China fit in all this? Because, you know. The Chi America relationship, which coincided with the the American unipolar moment over the past thirty years, and which I guess you could say originated with Nixon and his kind of splitting of the Soviet bloc, you know, how do you unwind that? I mean, if if China invaded Taiwan, if, if we had a situation where an analogous situation where China invaded Taiwan, and um, the world was appalled. And America was like, well, we need all these sanctions. I mean, I don't think we could do that if we wanted to. You know, that that would mean like the the <laughs> the shelves at Walmart would be barren and there would be no new iPhones for four years. Or I mean, it, the the Chimerica relationship is just so deep. 
I don't know how it can be unwound, but you know, I, I wouldn't put like too much stock in this friendship agreement that occurred in February before the invasion of Ukraine between China and Russia. I would, I, you know, there's a lot of kind of flowery language there, but it, it was about friendship without limits and so on. And so, you know, I, I think there might, that chimerica relationship might be something like of the past. It too might go away. And we're in a bifurcated world of, you know, Russia as supplying, um, looking east and basically supplying hydrocarbon energy to uh, China. And China kind of going through development where it's moving away from America, but developing it internally its own middle class and so on. Maybe even looking to Africa for minerals. And, you know, I think they even want to look to Africa for um, labor, although I think that's obviously uh, impossible. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of welcome such a world. Uh, Radar, do you want to talk? Yeah, thanks for the floor. Can you hear me well? Yeah. All right, so quick, I'll be brief. Uh, I understood, like, that you recognize the sort of the in, uh, incompetent geopolitical choices to ignore sort of like uh, Russia's, uh, you know, geopolitical imperative by the West over the last few years. So I understood that you recognize that fact. And I think what you're missing when you say that a lot of people that support the Russian position of treasonous is, is, is that, you know, a lot of us who see uh, that um, their reaction is sort of like the, sort of a logical outcome that uh, of like years of, uh, people in the State Department and in the Western institutions not really sort of seeing the world as sort of Henry Kissinger would see it. You know, because I think if, if people like Henry Kissinger were still in power or sort of those people who became of age during the attentate of the Soviet Union were in power, like stayed in power, say, after the, the 90s and the 2000s, this sort of like insistence on a rules-based order uh, that, you know, would never co consider the existence of spheres of influence um, or the, you know, the sorts of geopolitical imperatives. Uh, do you think, like, don't you see, like, that part of the argument? Like, don't you see that maybe, like, yes, it seems I, like it, it I was, like, looking at that? Or, sorry, just to wrap it up. Mersheimer, I, you know, more or less like Henry Kissinger. I mean, I, I understand this argument, but it's it's basically, like, ignoring any kind of agency on the on the part of Russia. I mean, I, you know, I have suggested like some kind of deal that could have been made over Ukraine. And, and I, and I kind of like John Mersheimer's strategic thinking where he's like, we actually need to reach out to Russia and work with Russians as we begin to oppose China. Like, I like that type of Machiavellian reasoning. I would agree with him if I were blessed to be the in the state department in the two thousands, that's how I would have thought. And I think I probably would have lost those arguments. And I also think that you, we can't deny Russian like agency here, you know, even if like Mersheimer wanted that and I want that and you might even want it, that doesn't mean that Putin ultimately wants that. I mean, Putin might equally want this kind of new order that we have. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I, again, I, my response to like, you know, NATO aggression or whatever, it's, it's like criticizing Michael Jordan for dunking a basketball. It's like, why would you dunk that basketball? That's so rude to the other team. You know, it's like NATO was created in 1949 as an anti-Soviet military alliance over a situation that actually is has some similarities to Ukraine. It was created over the German question. And so it's like, of course, it's directed against Russia. And now it makes a lot of sense. Now, could there have been like amazing creative thinking on both sides among Russians and Americans in the 90s and 2000s of like, let's bring Russia into this deal. We're going to totally refashion NATO's 
like strategic objective, and it's going to be a northern hemispheric military alliance of the white race. Yeah, that would have been great. I wish that would have happened, but it didn't. And we are here now. Sure, I, I understand those points, but at, at the same time, like, uh, you know, a, a better analogy would be like uh, a lot of people have seen a sort of like uh, unwillingness of, uh, like, let's say if a dog is, uh, you know, uh, cornered, it either like runs or it bites. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people like sort of see this situation where uh, Russia was backed into a corner and there's sort of like an automatic admiration but, but for, you you to, think, for you yeah, to like I, okay, uh, just you. fight I back, you, you. you know? You, but like, do you, was America like invading Russia? I mean, no, but I mean, uh, essentially, or was German? Sure, sure, mean, go ahead. Now, that, well, it's it's this weird situation where like Putin made his fear a reality. You know, it's like now there's serious talk of Ukraine being a member of NATO. Now, I don't think that's going to happen right away. My continued prediction is that that Ukraine will be divided. And that one part of it will be part of NATO, i.e. a German situation will repeat itself. But like Putin, you know, I don't know what to say. Like as, you know, the West, there's a lot of, you know, expansion and dirty dealings and whatever. But like it is what it is. Like now you have really created the Cold War again. And Putin did make that choice. And like the United States was not invading it. And... But do you remember the last, the last eight months of diplomatic sprint, right? Like they, they, they sent each other ultimatums. They were trying to get like a, a veto. That wasn't done in the last eight months. Like it, it was well, on the news all the Putin, time. Putin invaded Ukraine because Joe Biden predicted that he would? No, I think that he had a red line. It was very clearly like, no, don't do any bilateral like defense treaties of Ukraine. Don't NATO eyes Ukraine. Don't give them weapons or at least have just give them a veto, like a sort of Finlandization situation was sort of something he was probably angling for. That was completely taken off the table for purely ideological reasons, saying like, oh, like every country should be able to choose their own destiny. That's for me right. is a complete disregard for like, you know, real politic, you know. Cuba can't choose its own destiny. Neither does any country living next to a, a big power. You know, so like them not recognizing that, it just seemed like stubborn in my opinion and sort of like leading to this like well, uh, I mean, situation I, I, that I was, agree with you. Know. you. I, I kind of agree with, I mean, I agree with you to a large extent. I'll put it that way. I mean, I, my tendency, if I were involved in these decision makings is more real politique and just respecting that region. Now, but, you know, I don't know. It's also the nature of, like, making things that are implicit explicit and things that are unclear clear and creating lines and, and kind of expanding your influence. I mean, if you're not expanding, you're dying. So it just doesn't. Yes, like, so, so that's why a lot of people support it, the Russian position, I would say, not because they're like players, because they sort of see a real politic of the world that it's sort of like, well, I've already, go drive already drunk addressed this. And you crash. I get it but everything's messy and like, and just blaming, you know, I, I don't know, like everything's messy. And but, uh, let me just jump in with this. Yeah. Sure. With like for radar. So I could just turn this around on your argument and say, why shouldn't uh, Russia, res why should Russia disrespect our red lines? Why should Russia uh, not take our demands or, why shouldn't they be afraid of our nuclear weapons? I keep hearing all this fear mongering and it's the West that's powerful. So if we need to like listen to Putin and feel sorry for him, why not just turn it around? Why doesn't, why don't they listen to us? We're the West. No, but I, don't yo, I can apply to that. So, so essentially what, the way I see it is that he said, uh, uh, you know, he drew a red line on Ukraine. Ukraine was already not a member of NATO. He, he might've been in like, like many years in the future, but there has been a contentious issue since 2014. Like, lots of NATO countries were not willing to take in Ukraine, Ukraine, but were willing to, like, lead it on, like, make them believe they would, they, they would allow them to join someday. And in my opinion, that was, like, letting them on. So, so in, in a way, it, it comes down to force. Like, the Russians were willing to use force, as they did. So, like, nobody really, like, kind of took that into consideration when they were, like, 
telling Ukraine that someday they would join. So in my opinion, it's, you know, like supporting the Russian position is like, is like, is like supporting somebody that, that, you know, said something, said they were going to do something, clearly stated what the red line was. And you just said, oh, look, I don't believe in your rules. I'm going to do whatever I want. So um, uh, but basically, bottom line is like, uh, why shouldn't the Russians like, cross their NATO's red lines? I didn't see them crossing any NATO red lines. They didn't invade the NATO country. You know, they said that this one specific country that was not a NATO country could not join anymore in the future. After a lot of other countries join, I mean, NATO but, is at the Baltic Why right should now. we just so, endlessly, I mean, as I have stated, I would have operated a lot more like a realist if I were in power. But the, the question remains, like, why should we respect this red line? I mean, at the end of the day, Ukraine, I mean, I get it, but Ukraine is an independent country. And you can say it's fake and whatever, but like, it is what it is. They voted upwards of 80 to 90% for independence in the 90s. There is a huge upswell movement in 2004 and 2014 for kind of independence and, and particularly 2014 for like Western direction. So like, why does Putin just, why are we giving in to everything he wants? And we're, it's like, we're the bad No, I mean, you, you, because we don't respect you can do. him. Why, why not like challenge him? I mean. Sure, you can challenge it. And that's exactly what's happening now. You know, they didn't respect it. They didn't take his advice and his request. They didn't placate him or try to come to an agreement. And he used force. So that's how I see it, you know. Like, all right, you, you're free to do whatever you want. You're just not free from the consequences of doing whatever you want. You know what I'm saying? I can drive in the opposite direction. Well, but, but but Russia, it doesn't mean I won't get hit. Well, yeah, but, I mean, you can say that to Ukrainians, but, Ukrainians, but like, they are fighting absolutely resisting this and fighting ferociously and they should be applauded for yeah, and they will resistance. still lose they will they will just fight you know they'll fight to the last one and they will lose so what's really the point in my opinion like fighting a war that you know you're gonna that lose that's gonna happen i think ukraine's gonna end up being divided and that a lot of people are going to effectively live in the west at the end of this but secondly sure. telling us telling other people like don't fight an invading army. You're you're just gonna die. I mean, I, I find that kind of attitude just really grotesque. I mean, they can make their. I mean, for God's sake. I mean, they live there. They can make their choices. And I'm not gonna like. I mean, I might have my opinions, but I'm not gonna chastise them for picking up a gun, you know, and fighting off an invading army. I mean, like, but but what's the point of finding a war that you're gonna lose? Like, why not stick the deal, happen. find an agreement? You know, you're gonna lose. Like, like I mean, you can say that even if you know that they might like kind of like drag I it on, but Russia they're going at a huge cost. Really hard due to this conflict, and I think the existence of a Russian state is actually like at issue. And if they think that if Russia, if like all of this stuff now of like, oh, we're, we're moving to China, it's going to be better and whatever. I, I find that utter nonsense and just like almost like third worldist ideology about China. The idea that like China is going to treat Russians well and that being an energy provider for the Chinese is some great deal. I mean, if I were a Russian, I'd be horrified. And like... You know, I don't know how many times you can't lose super hard, like multiple times. And if Putin loses this gambit, which is a possibility, if not a likelihood, but a possibility, I, I think the existence of the Russian state is going to be under threat. And, you know, and all of these guys, these like neo reactionary people issuing all this, like, you know, stuff about how great the Russian army is and like, you know, how, you know, successful it is and organized. I mean, they're going to look like absolute fools. I, I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm not a military expert, so I'm not going to make like definitive opinions, but I think it's very clear that Russia is not being greeted as liberators and that they can just like knock out the regime and, 
people are going to applaud them and they're going to have like, they're going to do an annexation or, or something. I don't think that's happening. I think this is going to be a contested issue for like three decades, much like Germany. And, you know, I don't know how many times can Russia do this and not like well, jeopardize the existence of the Russian state itself. Couldn't you make an argument that like sort of the Soviet Union kind of held their own technologically in, in terms of global influence when they were around? Like they were, the, the Soviet Union is essentially the Russians and the, you know, yeah. the Ukrainians, you know, so it is isn't no doubt precedent that they actually could operate better under uh, circumstances of hostility as opposed to circumstances where they let their guard down like in the 90s and they threw it Yeah, collapsed. but keep in mind when Putin was stationed in East Germany, he was amazed at the higher living standards of this, you know, East German Republic vis-a-vis what the living standards Th- were. That's not what I heard from his interviews. He, he said that East Germany looked like it was stopped in time. That, that was what I said. I, I heard him say when he was interviewed with Oliver Stone. Would it say, repeat that again. I couldn't understand you. Uh, he said that the, the DDR, I think that's the name, uh-huh. uh, looked like it was stopped in time. Like, he looked like he had stopped in time. Like, he recognizes, uh, you know, from looking, I, I consumed a lot of content that, or interviews that he did. He recognizes yeah. the failures of the Soviet Union. Like, this is not yeah. a Soviet ideologue by any well, means. That, the 70s you know? and 80s was like a frozen... I, I think there's even a, a name for it in, like, Cold War history. It's it's the, like, the eternity kind of... Um, so, there's, some, there's some reference to it by historians where there was, like, very little technological development and kind of, like, seemingly no social development or change. It was just yeah, this he, kind he of, like... Him we got this thing going, the machines kind of operating, but it's just clearly, you know, slowly dying. He recognized that Soviet Union in the late 80s had become a gerontocracy. It was essentially all about party politics and the sort of ideological fervor and, and the, the hostilities that the countries went through, through the Second World War and the, and the Civil War in the 20s were both like sort of they kind of galvanized everyone to like go to like you know towards a purpose. So I think this generation got older, and the party ideology was kind of getting in the way of them like you know evolving into sort of modernizing themselves. So I think Putin recognized that, and his elites on, on the FSB, you know, the the, the the security apparatus there does recognize that. So I think this gamble is taking the old failures into consideration. So I agree with you, there's a possibility that it might fail. But I think the payoffs, if you win, and there's a like, it's more likely that you will work out, they're worth the risk, in my opinion, because, uh, you know, it's not like Russia was getting stronger over the, since the Cold War ended. They were getting like, substantially weaker. You know, they weren't yeah. even like, you know, they, were, they weren't even the villains in the, in the Hollywood movies anymore. You know, that's when you know you're not <laughs> strong. Anymore, so I'm saying like yeah. this does strike myself as a bold move. So like from a uh, you know a personality perspective and a you know willingness for him to do what's right by his people, you know it, it is admirable. That's not you know uh, that's not like a, doesn't make me like a shoe or a traitor thinking about that. But I'm just saying I, I you know I, not, I, I think allowing the Ukrainian issue to fester and would have been a better option. Doing nothing would have been a better option. But, but, anyway, but then they wouldn't just failed faster. Uh, I, get it. I get it. I, I, I get it. I, I've heard your perspective. Yeah, I appreciate your perspective. Okay, I want to move on a little bit. Uh, too hip. Do you want to jump in? Too hip. Okay, Luke, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was going to say, so what, what do you think would happen to have NATO come from this kind of i guess um what what looks to most people in in the alt right as a global homo kind of um uh i guess representative organization or adjacent organization what do you think it would take to move it from that to the i guess this new imperium of western man that you envision well i mean let, let's keep in mind i mean like Calling these things global homo is a bit deceptive, you know? I mean, I don't deny that you can find, like, NATO propaganda videos where there's some transgendered 
person talking about, you know, human rights or whatever. Um, you can find that in almost literally every institution that there is. Everyone has to kind of bend the knee to the current paradigm and pretend that they're woke and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, NATO still is a military alliance. And yeah, it had a kind of globo homo veneer, but it also is a collection of countries, many of which have nuclear capacity and almost all of which have some kind of military capacity. And in the case of France or Britain and, you know, a, a serious military capacity, both of those countries also have nuclear capability. Um, so I, I think it's like when you see this stuff on social media, you, you kind of like just think that it's a madhouse or something. And this, they like don't have strategic planning and all they are doing is talking about how to be more gay. And that's just wrong. Yeah. You know, and, and so like uh, what I am suggesting is that, and I admit that there's a lot of hope in this, like that now that the identity crisis is of, of the unipolar age has kind of ended that we're going to like be forced to really think strategically and be, be harder and more conservative and, and so on. And that this will kind of bring that about, but like on some level, NATO has always been a military force for the white race. Right. It just kind of didn't articulate it as such. Yeah. So that's how I'd answer that question. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great perspective. I, I will say, I think you're actually, your input in this has actually kind of changed my mind. I think that um, you're right to really lash out against the reactionary tendencies that are just, I mean, to, I actually, I did see your meme earlier, the people that say, uh, I don't support the current thing. I think that's a really good meme as well, because, yeah, I, I yeah. think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's finally people that lack a sort of vision and answer. Yeah. And they, they, just, they, they do go, they unthinkingly oppose everything and right. not everything is bad. You know, like I think it was probably, I mean, again, look, every, obviously people have the right to disagree with me or whatever. I think it's probably a good idea it, at the very least, if you're over the age of 40 to get vaccinated, you know, like, yeah. it's probably a good idea. And you know, it's just like a, just anything that a liberal says you, have to say no to it, it just becomes just utterly silly at some point and you end up doing this kind of thing where you're like oh i'm now pro russia and i now think vaccines are killer you know are the real killer and i you know again it's like if nancy pelosi told you that like green tea is good for your health or whatever you'd be like oh what, what's she up to with that you know, oh god the green tea that must like turn you gay or what you know like <laughs> it's just reactionary insanity and it's like if you can just pull yourself out of it and like for a moment you can you can think straight that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything i say but like at the very least you can kind of think outside the the hyper polarized paradigm and it does go the other way as well i you know i agree the like it we can point out liberal insanity as well but i i think that's in a, in a way kind of like easier <laughs> all right juan oh geez i didn't have my hand up you called me was that uh on purpose well you asked to be a speaker so oh i thought we were doing the hands here uh you actually called me <laughs> flat-footed um, all right don't think about it just calm no no i don't i Come so, up with a question. I'll go to Boris. Boris always has something to say. Boris. I mean, I can speak. I just... Uh, okay. So what I, was, uh, what I was going to say before I was caught flat-footed, and I think I know the answer, um, aren't they useful idiots in galvanizing consciousness? The Traitors Coalition? What do you mean? Well, I mean, you have to have some kind of foil. Like, they push... And they're going to cause a reaction. I mean, obviously, reactionary is bad, but it, oh, from mean, us, I think they're useful. I, I think they're useful idiots 
for Russia. And I, and I think to, in, in some very obvious cases, they are unequivocally Russian assets. I mean, they, they are, you know, they worked for RT and so on. I think in much more subtle ways, you have a lot of subtle Russian assets. Like I think Glenn Greenwald being this conservative grifter, like, most likely unintentionally is just, you know, it's like, well, you know, how can, what, what, how can we criticize Russia when like, you know, Fauci and Iraq war, and you know, like if you're just this weird, you know, person, then it's like, yeah, you're just supporting the other side. Um, I think in other cases, it's more subtle. And I, I think Russia has, basically promoted a lot of these types of, of thinkers who will kind of like subtly be useful idiots uh, for Russia. And, you know, like, I don't know. I, I saw this thing. I, I, mentioned I have a question thing. about NATO, Spencer, about your position on NATO. So you said that NATO would serve as just like a, uh, you know, army of people with uh, white people and stuff like that. So how do you reconcile that with NATO's decision to, say, intervene in Libya or Syria, which, which you know, for all purposes, were, it created a lot of migration flows that were one of the biggest demographic dangers to Europe. So how does that, like, both good in that sense and bad? You know, do you well, see my point? Ju- yeah, I do see your point. But, I mean, just, just because a bad decision is made doesn't mean that you know, NATO isn't a... But those are the biggest risks of, of like, uh, cohesive demographics in Europe, was those migration flows from both Africa and the Middle East. Well, I, those are both caused by NATO intended? not thinking through. Well, do you think that was intended by NATO, that, like, they decided... No, I don't to... think it was intended. Well, No, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think they thought that was going to happen, but it, it would have been, like, you made a serious analysis about it. You know, and I Gaddafi had, told, has said that. Well, I know you did. And, uh, no, I, 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 was wrong I remember that. Things, but... but I absolutely, uh, absolutely don't think that we should have involved ourselves in Libya. And I, I guess I have, uh, to be honest, uh, as I thought of these things, I, I kind of have a different, I might have a different view of the Middle East. I, I think that uh, I'm not sure that these kind of Sunni Western nationalists like pan arabist governments are really like something that works in the middle east so i'm i'm a little bit more skeptical of like the prospects for bashar al-assad i mean i i think that you know or or someone like saddam hussein these are the, you know a fact a, a little bit ambiguous with assad but there there there's more or less the sunni secular nationalist who would kind of variously seem like communist or variously seem like fascist, but they were, they were nationalists. Is that really a natural order in the Middle East? I mean, maybe a kind of more of like a Shia like order is actually going to bring more stability in the Middle East. I'm, I'm kind of kind of rethought some things in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point, but you know, I, I also see like a, you know, if you're in like for like a, uh, racial cohesiveness of uh, people of European descent, and the biggest threat to racial cohesiveness in Europe is like a giant migration yeah, we that were we unleashed. Fucked we fucked up. So, so, but that's what this institution does. Like they, they think about it. Like that's how I see NATO. Like, they think about in those liberal values, and they don't think two steps ahead. You know, at least the current leadership. So, so that's I what agree. happens. You know, I so agree, you, you maybe... know, supporting these institutions, but knowing that you know, it's not like Henry Kissinger is at the helm. It's like I some know, like we need you know Russia, affirmative action people. In order to get NATO thinking correctly, we need Russia to be Russia. Well, that's that a fair point, a but then you're for like a balance of power. Yeah, you know, and and, the, and 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 the war in Ukraine is is sort of like what's going to get to that balance of power. So sorry for the people who live there, but it's just how the geopolitical chess game is going to be played. And exactly. it isn't so it isn't necessarily traitors to think that they are actually even uh, you know by Putin moving into Ukraine, he brings back that world where the lines are more clearly drawn. There's no more like you know, fakeness, uh, there's less fakeness, you could say, because everybody's intention is sort of on the table, so you can kind of get moving to the next place, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, Juan, you wanted to say something, and then I'll go to Boris, and then I have a couple other people. Yes. Uh, I think between uh, your conversation with Radar, it kind of filled out my point. Um, you need an antagonist to achieve consciousness. Yeah. Are you totally divorced from stoking that and you're totally in the positive because um, I don't, you probably don't remember, but maybe two or three days ago, um, we kind of had a conversation very short, but it's like, how do you get there? Um, and it seems like this is the, like, you don't get there unless you have some kind of action. And this is the impetus, at least it, it to me, at least it seems for sure. This is the impetus to, at least your larger project. Yes. All right. Uh, Boris, would you like to talk? Uh, I'm sorry, Richard. Did you, did you call on me? Uh, well, yes. Oh, if yes. You, if you request to be a speaker, yes. you've got to be on your text. Sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Uh, just just wanted to add a little bit of a perspective on on NATO. I, um, as I was listening to the discussion, um, one thought that um, kept um, popping up was to what extent um, the discussion of NATO's role in in uh, the current situation um, has been exaggerated outside of Russia. If you listen to Putin's speech that basically he, he spent 54 minutes um, uh, right uh, after the first day of, of bombardment of Ukraine, um, uh, basically going into his vision of history and what um, reasoned uh, he had for, for doing what he was doing. Um, yeah. NATO was like... Uh, you know, on minute 47 of that speech. Uh, hmm. No one in his inner circle, including himself, um, I can guarantee you that, uh, sees NATO as a real threat. And uh, NATO is used um, mostly for domestic audiences as kind of a straw man because they needed some um, justification for what um, what's happening. But um, if... If we go back to kind of the origins of um, this, I mean, before 2014, or, or actually before 2004, um, there was not a, a single cloud on the horizon. Um, Ukraine was just um, kind of a, a poor, uh, more corrupt, more anarchic version of Russia without the, the money, uh, mm. without the drama, without the scale. Um, so, but I could not have imagined any course of events that would develop in the, in the direction where it's headed now or where it's already gone now. I was in Kiev in 2004 during the Orange Revolution. I spent a weekend there um, just walking wow. the street. I happened to be, I had a friend there who was, who was based there at the time and my wife and I just started dating. So it was one of our first trips and we, we took a weekend trip there. And I remember the feeling it was, uh, it felt like a, a festival. There was not um, anything in the air that would um, suggest any kind of retribution or, or, or just ill feelings. It was people were truly out celebrating. And, and what, what led to it, if, if you guys remember, um, Ukraine had um, presidential elections shortly before that. And Russia's favorite candidate, Yanukovych, I remember in the, in the months or in the weeks leading up to it, uh, Moscow had billboards. Moscow had billboards all over Moscow promoting Yanukovych. Hmm. Basically, you know, we're, we're endorsing Yanukovych, blah, blah, blah. It's pretty bizarre that a foreign country would have billboards uh, favoring a presidential candidate in another country. So when Yanukovych lost and um, 
there was some dispute. I can't remember exactly the technicalities of it, but basically, um, there was some reason for uh, for Russia to uh, spin it in a way that uh, to present it in a way that the, the election was stolen or something like that. And that was the first time when, well, the, that was the first grudge that Putin um, held against Ukraine. Um, he went on a limb, endorsed the candidate. That candidate lost. Uh, Ukrainians rejoiced. It was very clear that you know this is who they wanted. Now the guy that ended up being president of Ukraine for the next several years, Yushchenko, turned out to be a complete failure. Yeah. Um, and then he was run out of town. He was. He was not. He, he lost the election, and there were the, there was a succession of a you know a number of very messy situations, and Yanukovych ended up being elected. That time, fair and square, nobody disputed it. People, a lot of people didn't like it, but it was just because and his campaign it, manager was Paul Manafort. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and he turned him into a conservative candidate. Like there is a lot of interest. I I've even seen this on like really mainstream like MSNBC now. But I remember seeing these um, things like years ago where they were they were comparing like mainstream Republican advertising and messaging with Yanukovych's, and it was just um, uncanny. Like, right. The, the it was it was just this weird like you know I mean and again it was the, the the reason for it was obvious like Republican hacks went to Ukraine to elect this guy it was it was remarkable yeah it it was bizarre but the the kind of the essence of what was happening at, at that during that period of time is that Ukraine didn't seem to be able to field um, a candidate that was decent. And Yanukovych ended up winning second time around because the electorate was divided. There was this populist, crazy uh, woman, uh, Timoshenko, Mm -hmm. who was widely rumored to be um, heavily corrupt. She was instrumental to um, Gazprom um, giving um, giving Ukraine a number of sweetheart deals, and she was credibly accused of having profited from it and so forth. So, so I can see how, you know, after that first uh, uh, fiasco in two thousand four, and watching what happened in Ukraine after that, Putin might have developed contempt because it was messy, it was dysfunctional. And to add insult to injury, Yanukovych um, was run out of town at the end of the day by another revolution. And he was clearly favored. He was, he was clearly Putin's um, man there. So, you know, over the years, contempt and this complete visceral hatred of that country developed in addition to a very uh, strong fear that... Um, a country this close with a nation that is many Russians view as indistinguishable uh, from Russia with, you know, thousands of years, not thousands, maybe maybe about a thousand years of common history. uh, Having these kind of political outcomes where people actually take to the streets and throw out the bums and replace them with people who they trust and, and like gives it's too it hits too close to home and it gives his own people his own electorate too bad of an too dangerous of an example that something like that could happen um i i've heard many times that uh one of the um developments one of the events in in recent history that traumatized putin a lot was the footage of Gaddafi being sodomized and, and killed yeah by, uh, by those uh, uh, crowds in, um, in Tripoli and again I have no idea how true that is but he, he is rumored to have watched that that video many times and 
just obsessed over it because he whenever he sees something like that he he tries it on himself and he and he, he was absolutely paranoid about making sure this doesn't happen to him so contempt hatred and fear for his own uh fate um over the years compounded and kind of basically let him so i i i have to put an end to this and nato was kind of a convenient straw man uh for for him to sell that to uh whoever he needed to sell it both in the west and and uh among his own um electorate so that's that's what i wanted to say yeah yeah definitely i always uh I always like it when you uh give us your perspective for us. Thank you. Um yeah, um I let's see. We've been going for 2 hours. Um let's let ev- I'll, I'll let the um some other you guys I'll just let everyone in. Um I would just suggest that we keep it brief and um because we've talked about a, a tremendous amount but um keep it brief but you can get your uh uh two cents in uh jeff gold you're up jeff okay um stan giesbrecht Hi, yeah, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm, my ears perked up when you talked of um, Ukraine uh, being separated. Um, because I, I think what, what they're fighting for is that, that they won't be separ- uh, divided. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like if, if, um, if they would have offered some kind of a division, this war would have never happened. Like... If they had a... Well, are you talking about like the Donbass regions? If if we had just simply recognized them, or or something like that? Yeah, or absolutely. Force if... Ukraine to allow secessionism. Like if they had, a... I mean, if they recognized Crimea um, as Russian, recognized those regions as independent, would 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 this war have even happened? Well, I mean, I. You know, again, if I were in the State Department and I wanted, you know, to respect Russia and, you know, I I could imagine, you know, being convinced of such a thing where we we would kind of reach a compromise and do it peacefully. Um, Again, if you listen to uh, Putin's own justification for war... I mean, they are the same people. I mean, th- this was a historical error to ever allow something like Ukraine to exist. So whether he would have accepted that is a question. Um, I, I just I don't think I mean, America, I don't I don't think it would have accepted the notion that you can just secede from a country and that you just will immediately be accepted in that fact. I mean, that that would you know it's a precedent that would be set and it and it creates a certain amount of chaos and you know there is certainly like anti-russian sentiment in the united states you know obviously anti-putin sentiment um whether they would have wanted to do that is, is questionable but you know i i don't know i mean i i just think these are kind of like could have should have and i you know if i were in the state department i might have tried to reach some accommodation like that um but i, I but, don't think they will now and and there are ukrainian nationalists the azov battalion being you know a, an extreme expression of it but who absolutely i mean they do not they do not want to give up any territory and just allowing russia just to come and take stuff because they can i mean they're going to fight back against that like I, I am extremely critical of, of how the West handled this. Like Putin had his troops there for a whole year, and either like Joe Biden and, and uh, Boris Johnson, either they put troops in Ukraine or they have to give Putin some concessions. Like I, I think that should be a like obvious. Like why, either you why just give people concessions? Pardon me. Well, why why 
I mean, why why do we just give concessions if Putin puts troops somewhere? I mean, he's the leader of, of you know, a, a superpower. And at some point, that has to be recognized. I know. I mean, it's Amer- it, America does recognize that. I mean, Joe, Fi- Joe Biden has been emphatic that they are not going to engage in a no-fly zone over Ukraine, that they will supply Ukraine with weapons, but there are just clear lines to what they are willing to do. I mean, they, they respect russia as any sane person should but like you know you can't just if someone said if they like amass an army somewhere you can't just be like well okay then you know here you go i mean you have to you know countries are going to operate under their interest and they're going to try to gain something and you know i again as i've said numerous times now i probably would have if I were in power, I would have tried to work something out. But all of this is lost to time at this point. Anyway, um, I, I have a different question I, I'd like to ask. Um, this is an AMA, okay. what the all right? Um, is, yeah. So, so you, you, you changed, you talked about evolution of your thinking from like 2016 to now. Um, if, you, if you could pick one thing that, that caused it more than anything else, like, like COVID or, or is there anything in particular that stands out for changing your thinking? Yeah, I mean, I I think that a couple of things. I mean, I, I think the the absolute COVID denial that was popular on the former alt-right or the dissident right or whatever, I just saw that as just insane. And I just, I, I think it probably more than anything burned a lot of bridges because you know, it's like, oh, look at here, Spencer. He's an establishment shill. He believes the COVID lies and blah blah blah. I think it burned bridges where, like, all these people that I otherwise, were, you know, that I was kind of colleagues with to some extent, just viewed me as anathema. Um, I, I think I also was just, uh, I, I, I mean, I liked the idea of Trump as a chaos agent to some extent. Like he was a wrecking ball, and I felt like you know, well, let's just try this, you know, like this guy's just changing everything and let's just, let's go for it. And maybe we can end up on top. And I, I, I just, I don't know. I look back at, you know, where, where populism leads and it it does seem to kind of like, it, it seems to be based on an emotional lashing out at the world. And it seems to kind of almost inevitably degenerate into this like Marjorie Taylor Green tier nonsense. And I, I just, I'm very skeptical of trying to align with these forces when, you know, out, if you don't have a vision, you don't really have a future. And just hating on people and whining and getting mad, it, it, it's, it's understandable on some level, but it just, it does not lead anywhere outside of the, this kind of nonsense that we have to deal with now. So I, 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 I think I always had it, my instincts were to be skeptical of populism, but I, I think I, I kind of like went with, just kind of got so caught up in it that I, I think I put a lot of my, like, you know, critical analysis besides. And then, and then also the people who were promoted by Trumpism and, and I mean, literally Trump and, and so on are just, not the best people. And so I, I was deeply disappointed in that. And I, I think I've, I've also kind of viewed uh, the alt-right with through a darker lens. You know, I, I kind of liked the idea of, oh, we have all these anonymous shitlords out there, you know, yeehaw. And I kind of view of it now. It's like, there are a lot of people who don't want to take responsibility for anything. And there are a lot of people who have bad motives and, I, I just, I don't see it as workable. Um, yeah, so it was just a lot of different things. But I mean, in terms of also, if you look at my own personal history, I mean, I voted for John Kerry in 2004. So it's not like I, I you know, voting for a Democrat is some new thing. <laughs> like I've never been as polarized as a lot of people, you know, might think. I mean, I, I thought George Bush was particularly in his in his first term where he, he really was pushing 
forward all these terrible, you know, foreign policies. I mean, yeah, I would I would vote for John Kerry in a heartbeat just to be against that. I, I'm I'm OK with that. And I, I think the you know, the dissident right or the alt right or whatever, they're they're deeply polarized and they're just allergic to, to any thinking like that, any kind of uh, pragmatic thinking in, in, in many ways. But I, I just feel like there has to be a vision. We have to construct a vision through intellectual activity and just getting into these endless, you know, political fistfights. It just it, it's it's t- it's exhausting after a while and it doesn't really advance the ball in any way. And so that that's that's how it is. Somehow my connection is terrible. It, it cut in and out. I got most of what you said, but okay, but uh, not a good connection. All right. Okay. Uh, has anyone else not spoke? Oh God! Five more people came in. Oh God! I have the tendency to just be so long-winded. Um, all right. You have to be. This is lightning round. Okay. So I'm just going to go through everyone here. Hello. Yeah, um, sorry, it takes me a second to yeah, switch. you can speak. Light Patriot, you Hello. can speak. This, we are in the lightning round section of this oh, okay. uh, top 40 hit countdown, so you got to be fast. Oh, crap. Well, I think I have one question I might bring up. Uh, one second. Yeah. Okay. All right, Dan. Sorry, you got to be fast. Lightning round, um, Dan. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Good morning from Russia, Mr. Spencer. Good morning. I uh, just want to point out, firstly, your connection's a little rough, so I think we're having a little bit of trouble understanding you at Is times. It? Yes, sir. I wonder if it's my Bluetooth. I thought it was me, but judging from the, uh, the earlier gentleman complaining, I think it's you. Okay. Well, you can um, hear me now, right? Yeah, well, well enough. Okay. Uh, lightning round, so I'm going to be quick. Um, I supremely disrespect your attempt to pathologize people who disagree with you as the traitor circle or whatever you're calling it. Um, I didn't betray my country. My country betrayed me, and that's what it comes down to. If you are truly a proponent of American exceptionalism, then you won't simp for an America that stops being exceptional. And that applies now more than it ever has in our lifetimes. So I don't consider myself any less of an American because I live in Russia. Real American, we have to support our geopolitical enemy. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that you have to acknowledge when American foreign policy is poor or negative or aggressive or openly hostile has there ever been a time where it wasn't i would say before our lifetimes yes but uh 70s 80s on especially since the end of the cold war it has been we, we we have been a unilateral amoral empire i mean whether you want to admit it or not we've always seen ukraine as russia Everyone's always seen Ukraine as Russia, except maybe Ukrainians. And we are clearly directly involved in Russia's backyard, manipulating political events and mass protests to the benefit of our circle. It's not a moral position. You seem to be a very disappointed American. I guess I have a, a bit of a more realistic or kind of cynical approach to foreign policy. So I'm not really disappointed. I mean, it's like, this is how empires act. And at the end of the day, whatever you want to say about bad foreign policy decisions, which I also oppose, um, we are like living here in this empire and we also do receive protection from it. And like, people in say the Baltic states uh, or other places, they don't view NATO as like, oh, it's gay. Uh, They view it as this is genuinely protecting us 
from tanks rolling in as they did in Ukraine. And even if, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, the Ukraine and just treat it as Russia. Um, I mean, if that if that were the case, why do they need to kill anyone to accomplish this? Because I mean, we spent billions of dollars directly influencing the Ukrainian identity, how they see themselves, what they're taught in school. And we have been doing this in many countries for many decades. Well, I mean, even if that's the case, I mean, I, I don't think you can adjust consciousness to that degree. But I mean, Putin spent untold billions in the same way. Um, I mean, it's it's a war and some people are more successful at, at it than others. I mean, do, do you think Ukrainians during the Stalin era, you know, loved it? I mean, it, I don't know. It's like things haven't turned out the way you like. And so you, you call it immoral. But no, I'm saying that over a decade, Ukraine has become the human capital or the human trafficking capital of Europe. Its GDP per capita is lower than Albania. It's a shithole. Let's be honest. We created a shithole by funding our oligarchs and not caring about the well-being of the Ukrainian people. I believe Putin genuinely cares more about the Ukrainian people than the junta that we've essentially established in Ukraine. Well, I mean, how best to show your care for the Ukrainian people than, than killing them? I mean, he's sending them to heaven, I guess. I mean, he must really love them. I mean, what you're saying is just absurd. It's, it's not absurd, sir. You're just twisting history and the current situation to suit well, like, American foreign policy. That he loves them so much that he wants to kill them. Isn't that kind of an odd love? The history of Russian politics going back you know, over a thousand years is one of internecine struggle and conflict to assert dominance. It has always been this way. It probably will always be this way. Well, also, well, uh, where comes your your moral critique of American foreign policy then, if you embrace that with Putin? Because that's not foreign policy. That's internal domestic policy for the Russians. So it would be okay if America like instead of invading Iraq, just was bombing Alabama? No, but it's not any better to do what the U.S. is doing than for Russia to supply ATGMs and Stinger missiles to Texas separatists. It's the same thing. Okay, but we live here. And so it's like, I don't want him doing that because he doesn't wish the best for the United States, and I live here. I mean, unlike Russians, uh, unlike the Kremlin, I actually do wish the best for Russia. I mean, I would have loved the idea of a, you know, Russia, NATO, and, and great relations. I, I have no ill will. I don't want to spread chaos in Russia. But the Kremlin clearly wants to spread chaos in my country. And so there's a kind of unrequited love, you could say, that I have with Russia. Wait, and um, so we like sent a, a Yale influence. scholar, we sent Alexei Navalny to Russia while his family was in the United States. We are directly engaging Russia on every level with soft and hard power. Well, yeah, that's and then, uh, how the game is played. Boys. Look at Ukraine since 2014. It's turned into like this playground uh, piggy bank for all sorts of uh, shady, you know, rich people. Uh, well, you could so say the same thing about Russia itself. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't think so. Russia, uh, I don't think Russia was turned into the piggy bank of like you know these Western it's the piggy banks for Putin aligned oligarchs. It clearly, no, the the reason that uh, we had this falling out. Uh, you know, relations soured was because uh, they wanted Russia to be subordinate. They uh, they didn't want them to uh, you know develop their country. They wanted them to like you know uh, be a be like a good um, obedient uh, non threatening country like Ukraine was. Uh, I heard them describe Ukraine as a uh, an anti Russia like the, this, the, the, which is like a, a good description. I think uh, I think Putin said that in his speech before the invasion. 
He said like it was a hostile anti-Russia that was taking shape. Um, so the, the character of this war is kind of like, it's like national liberation. It's like uh, when the North Vietnamese invaded South Vietnam. Like you see all these, uh, the rats fleeing the sinking ship. Well, that's who's, who's running away from Ukraine. So all these, all the anti-Russian Ukrainians are leaving. So I think uh, when this, the resolution of this will be a, like a more pro-Russian Ukraine that will get sanctioned by the West uh, again. And also to being friends. It's friendly. just grotesque what you're saying. I mean, yep. like the entire, I mean, yes, there are pro-Russian elements in Ukraine. And I think there are a lot fewer of them now, but the, there is a, I mean, from what I can tell, and obviously I don't have perfect information, so on. From what I can tell, there seems to be a just popular, to- popular mobilization resistance to this invasion. I mean, I, 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 I think this is unwinnable. I mean, I don't, I, if, if things went like according to the dream of Putin, you know, he would just kill the Nazis and the, you know, Ukrainians would rejoice. I mean, clearly that okay. is not happening. Well, that's given, happening in Mariupol that, right now. Given that, I have a single question oh more, and then I will, uh, I will recess. Um, if that turns out completely false, if within the next few months Russia is able to just take control of the entirety of Ukraine, and there is not so much as a um, rebel movement or resistance movement, would you concede that that was false? Or would you continue saying exactly what you're saying now, even with uh, without any evidence? Well, I mean, I would have to see what happens. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I could definitely I mean, countries do get conquered and that doesn't mean that they like it. You know, I mean, like I, I could imagine Russia just kicking the ass of Ukrainians and at the end of the day, you know, NATO is not going to fight and die over this. They, they'll, they will help and supply, you know, weapons. But, you know, if they, if they engage in, if they totally win and Ukraine is demoralized, then I don't think that proves your point that they were like always Russians or something. Um, but, I mean, if I saw them rejoicing in the streets and welcoming Russian armies, I would agree with you. Now, again, who who has perfect information? I mean, I am just simply going with what I'm seeing, and it's a lot of it's on social media, and a lot of it's from the mainstream media. I will admit that, but like, I do not see that. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what to say, but I I do think that there for, there probably was an optimistic reading in the Kremlin that we can just like kill the Nazis and. Ukrainians will be Russians. I don't think that's happening. And I think it's gotten to the extent that I, I don't quite think this is going to be rulable and that a German, a German outcome is almost like optimistic at this point. That's my assessment. But Wait, uh, optimistic from a Russian POV or a Western POV? I, at this point, I think from a Russian perspective, like at this point, I think that a German solution to this is almost optimistic because the other solution is Russia loses or Russia is engaged in like a 10 year long insurgency or just horrible war that leads just total like further delegitimizes the country. And I I just don't see this as going well for Russia. I mean, they, they, yeah. Well, I mean, lots of people have said uh, Russia is on the brink and they're about to lose. I mean, Hitler said, all we have to do is kick in the door and the whole structure will fall down. Uh, you know, um, what about what about um, the Hungarian um, uprising? Uh, Russia went in to, to crush that. Uh, and Russia didn't collapse right after that either. So, well, of um, course not. But I mean, that, that's it. That goes back to like Dan's comment. I mean. In 1957, do you want to say that, oh, now Hungarians really want to be communists? They just love it. You know, it's like, no, they were defeated, you know, yeah, in and an then, uprising that failed. And they're now like really scared and demoralized. Well, yeah. And then a lot of a lot of the anti-communist Hungarians, they fled west. 
and that you know the Hungarian government, uh, what was it? It was in place until like what 1989. So yeah, and that's yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, they could achieve something like that in Ukraine. I mean, look at Belarus. Uh, Russia has never had to invade Belarus, uh, and they have good relations with them. So I mean, they could they could have a, a friendly Ukrainian government. Well, yeah, and, and- it's the only friendly government that Russia can have, just like a vassal state. But I mean, you know, I, don't, I mean, like I don't, whatever you want to say about NATO, like Germany is not France's pawn, and pawn and France is not Germany's pawn. You know, like yeah. they they are co-equals and they're different, but they can have like unified objectives. They're not just like yeah. the well, bitch of the other I, country. I mean, but, yeah, but I mean, America's got a much stronger ties to Ukraine than Russia has to. Uh... Belarus. I mean, if you look to, I mean, or Hunter Biden's uh, connections to Ukraine. I mean, and the, all the other oligarchs, all of them have Ameri- connections yeah, to America. Yeah, America treats Ukraine I mean, like a vassal. It's not. Can I like, say one thing? It's not. It's nothing like how Russia treats Belarus. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so have you heard of like surrogacy? Apparently, that's like that was a big industry in, in Ukraine, and guess until now, until Putin put the kibosh on it. But surrogacy is like. It's where they artificially inseminate uh, women for money, uh, and then they like have your kid. And that was like a big industry in Ukraine. Isn't that just like pathetic? Like, well, I Ukraine don't support to be... any of this. But th- th- it's it's a tiny country that has like its GDP has gone down over the past twenty years. I mean, it, it's like a lot but of it, really shitty things happen. It, in... But what what were those shitty things? It used to be uh, this in- industrial heartland of uh, you know a modern technological superpower. Uh, and um, that now it's now it's turned it's like a piggy bank for like you know uh, the buy like you know some like well connected well healed westerners and uh, the collaborators on the ground. So I, I don't know. I think what yeah, Russia's I doing think. is actually better uh, for Ukraine in the long run. And uh, okay, I mean that that's your opinion. I mean it, it's just like. I don't know. Like you, you when when people are fighting back, you have to respect that. Yeah, but who is fighting back? Who? Well, it's I, not. I, it's not like you, it's all like traitors. Like whatever. I mean, like but I'm not one of these people that's like, oh, they're the same people. Therefore, they have to. You know, they can they can treat them like they're exactly like Russians. Or they are Russians. They don't have any sovereignty. I'm not. I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is that the support for Russia and then the opposition to it to it it's it's uh qualitatively different these are different kinds of people um who doesn't say nazi for no reason um there's like the there's like a uh ukraine had to ban large opposition parties in the country uh one of them being uh, their communist party uh at the post maidan uh junta government um yes. the, the the people who oppose yeah, russia withdraw. they're like they are fascists withdraw. they're they're, well, they're misanthropic or they're they're liberals uh, you know, uh, I know, I know uh, Putin's well, been I don't know what you say, William. Uh, yeah, liberal. Italian seems pretty badass to me. Just saying, they, they seem like they're kicking ass. They're greasing the bullets. Uh, do, do, do you think that crucifixion... Uh, but so, they're yeah. going to lose, Do you, do you think the crucifixion I mean, is great? It is badass, but they're also going to lose, though. I mean, it is cool, but, like, we'll they're going to get... We'll see about that. that yeah, kinda... They are going to lose, though. I'm sorry. I So, I just think it's... That's uh, look, very sadistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hanging off the pregnant women, I don't really think that's badass. I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I just think, I mean, that, that, that's like saying that all the terrorists in Italy are badass because they... I mean, you know who looks badass right now? Uh, the the Kadurovites actually look badass. They walk into the town and, like, the, the Russian kid's like, oh, I, I was so scared of you, I thought you were going to come shoot everyone. And then they're like, no, the Chechens come and protect everyone. That is Look, badass, though, to be someone who like protects war people. Crimes on That's heroic. All sides. Well, I mean, you you can find war crimes on all sides, but it's like you have to look at the big picture. And what you're claiming is that like Ukraine, like uh, the Ukraine is not engaged in resistance to this invasion. Yeah, it's not a people's. It's not like an organic resistance. It's like well, it's like heart. Just, this is just nonsense. What, it's, is uh, it all a CIA black ops? Are there like riot? Are they like are there like riots forming against like Russian uh, soldiers? Are they like There's spontaneous riots pushing back against the troops and um, 
I mean, to some degree, what you could see in the future is kind of what is in Crimea. There's some pro-Ukrainian activism in Crimea, um, but usually that gets cracked down by the police. So it's just an example you could look into, as well as um, the fact that I've only, I mean, I've seen a lot of, I mean, this could just be, you know, the algorithms, but I mean, I've only seen like one guy put out a hammer and sickle in front of his house compared to Ukrainians getting shot by Russian troops protesting. So really, you know. so oh, really protesters are getting shot by Russian troops. Okay. So, uh, they're, so they're, are sorts. they gay ops? Are they just all, you know, yeah, I mean, intelligence what, what are you fronts? Guys yeah. Even talking about <laughs> at this. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. This is just, like, is this all a Western psyop that, like, you? There's no free speech in Russia at this point, at least with regard to the war. That you are going to say fifteen years in prison. You'll get fifteen uh, years in prison if you do this. That oh, that that video of those people talking to a journalist, like, oh, here's my opinion. Before they even she even said it, she's just thrown into a van. Like this is just a this is like the CIA or something. I mean, it's just. Like, what are we talking? I mean, this is just. Um, I mean, but, but there, let's be honest here. Let's be honest here. Let's minimize an invasion of a country. Well, I mean, but, but, but let, let's yeah, be honest here. I mean, okay. the largest opposition party is uh, the communist parties, and they are allowed to operate most freely in Russia. I mean, so the, also that all, the, all these shit lips are getting discriminated against. That's not really any different from. Yes. And we have the Republican Party. Is, yeah, they, I mean, the in, in the West. Let, let me like, let what about finish it, this though? point. Let me finish this. I mean, uh, that shit lips are discriminated in Russia. That's not really any difference how, how Nazis are discriminated in the West or how Islamists are treated. So I don't really see it. So, 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 so you can't really say that, oh, they don't have any free speech in Moscow when, when they have this huge parties, uh, opposition party, which are allowed to operate more or less freely. And um, it's quite an argument. Does free speech yes, so... even exist? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I tend to agree with that around the edges, but like something, I mean, well, I, I tend to agree with that, like free speech, ult, you know, it, it's it's ultimately like bound within a community where you, you agree on real basic things and then you can argue about the ability to policy. state your position is kind of how I would define it. Well, I mean, we don't have that freedom in the West necessarily. I mean, yeah, we do actually. Yeah. I mean, look. I have faced like, sort of horrible deplatforming, particularly, you know, like, and I would not claim that, like, we just have a total absence of free speech. No one's arresting me and putting me in prison for 15 uh, years. A ton of people prison. that followed you are in prison right now. Yeah. Like uh, guys that I know are in prison because they did what you did. Oh, that, oh because they did what I did. Did, oh, did. Really? Really? Who are you talking about? Ram? They, yeah, I'm responsible for them. You are just such a piece of shit. Yeah, I was the one who supported these people who went to these rallies specifically and solely in order to get into street fights. Apparently, I was responsible for them. You, you actually sound a lot like the plaintiffs in a lawsuit that I was involved in. Sound a lot like that blaming me apparently they have no i'm not idea. blaming you we all took that risk upon ourselves but i'm saying for you to deny that being an I activist ram, I actually dan i think ram making your opinions public president. is dangerous in the united states and it has been for a long time that ram is, is not in prison for expressing opinions they are in prison for getting into street fights but you know and because the alt-right like was like we can't counter signal anyone they'll basically say it's like saying the j6 people are in prison for being conservatives no actually they're in prison for invading the capital there are lines actually and weirdly i wasn't thrown into prison after charlottesville because i didn't harm anyone But, uh, oh, I don't know. Maybe it was because they, they went after, but, you know, they went after Ram for, for speaking out against liberals. Give me a break. I will say one thing. I, I've always been very I, surprised. I support the imprisoning of Ram. Just to, I hope I get that on the record. I'm glad that they are in prison because they're thugs. 
and thugs should be in prison. There, is that good for you? Lock them up. Well, anyway, uh, anyway, the point being, uh, I think I just think that the there's like a there's like a misanthropic, uh, anti-human side in this conflict, and that's like the, in Ukraine. Uh, those are the people that are gonna are willing to do the dirty work to uh, to oppose uh, you know Russian influence in Ukraine. It's like it's there was a guy in here. Hold on, I forget his name. Was it Salt or I, I don't know? But he he basically said like, oh, it's only like. Uh, weirdo anti-social uh incels uh who uh you know they just have these uh uh nihilistic fantasies and wishing for doom um th- yes. th- those are the people who support russia and it's like yes. that's not true it's it, it it might actually be imagine it flipped around it's like it's like the anti-human people who don't want development and don't want progress they they oppose russia and they like the west or they they prefer Hold on. I mean, I like the West oh, too. So that's the our, whole that's our There's team. a little bit on both sides. But, no, I, I like the West too. Like, you know, we don't want shit posters in our foxholes. I agree. You know, kick them off the team. Don't demoralize your side. Um, but we are like, hold on. There, there's a reason that uh, America couldn't let Russia in NATO. And it's because we are not in control of our country. Okay. Like we're controlled the way Ukraine is controlled from like, this like thin crust of like, you know, yeah, that, anti-human the, thugs his, who who are doing. The world. That's no, the it's, history of the world is that the there's an alternative. Are not, con- are not in control of their country. I mean, that, you know, that is that's not true. There, there are, yeah, there are. Yes, it is true. There's an alternative, though. I mean, I, I, uh, socialism. Uh, oh my God. You know, I, I, I think that is real. Um, we can see it happening. Um, I mean, we can see it happening right now. We can see uh, countries like uh, Syria, they can hold on against like all this, all these attacks from all sides just because they have like people power. In fact, it's the 15th of March, right? It's the Ides of March. Um, That's when Julius Caesar uh, was stabbed and he was stabbed uh, by uh, some elitists, right? They didn't like that Caesar was a populist who who uh, was, you know, emancipating the people he was giving. He was representing, you know, the masses. He was going to give them more privileges and rights. And he was stabbed by, uh, what, Brutus, Cassius, uh, all the cons- conspirators, right? They said, oh, he's a tyrant. He's a tyrant. He has this mob of crazy people behind him. You know, he's rabble-rousing. He's a, a demagogue, right? Um, but they-, they represented, like, the upper class, the landed, the privileged, and all that. Um, and Julius Caesar was, like, this populist leader in a way. Um, have, you- have you ever heard of uh, Michael Parenti's uh, The Assassination of Julius Caesar? No, is that a no? Book? Well, yeah. Uh, well, he was a. I don't know. He wrote like a bunch of books, but that one is like his take on the uh, assassination, and it's like a it's like a Marxist analysis of the what do you call it? The Roman Civil War. What was that whole war called? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The triumvirate that came out. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So that's what that's called. Um. Anyway, uh, I didn't. I didn't have a question. I just. I just had to like push back against some of the stuff I was hearing. Um, You're a true oh, believer, oh. William. <laughs> No, I did I, have uh, one question I want to ask. Sure. I thought about it earlier. And I was curious what your position is. What are your thoughts on the sanctions that have been applied on Russia? And then maybe more generally, like, you know, for example, with Cuba or Venezuela. Like, well, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, think, I think even calling them sanctions at this point is incorrect. I mean, uh, the, this is a bifurcated world. And this is a, you know, canceling of Russia, you could say. Um, And I don't think these can be just unwound. And I don't think they will be at least, at least for a decade. Um, So, I mean, this is, these aren't sanctions is that that's almost like a, you know, this is a total cold war economic policy towards Russia right now. Yeah, it's, there's it's worse. Uh, it's even worse than the Cold War. I think we're more nation statewide yeah. deplatforming. Um, yeah. But you could, like, um, like I believe there's been some government sanctions. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I would say it's probably going to switch more to the private compared to maybe um, how the U.S. sanctions like Cuba, Iran, or Venezuela. It's going to be a bit more different. Yeah. But I, I, I think that this is, you know, true globalization is over. 
and we're we're moving much more towards some kind of bifurcation again how china is going to you know china is a wild card and they they obviously have not denounced the invasion and they're kind of biding their time we'll see what happens but i mean i think it the the unwinding of china america which is like trillions of trillions of dollars like this is gonna yeah. happen and I, or, or uh, i'll say this this could happen now and like in 2007 or something you know the iphones just released and all this kind of stuff the unwinding of chimerica that that just seemed impossible you know it's like oh no you know this is so deeply integrated you know walmart plastic stuff you know computer technology etc now i i think it's possible and i don't know i i you know it's something i i want to think about more and read about more i i don't know the answer to how this is you know going to happen but uh this um coupling with china uh that happened in the first place um to wasn't it to break up the 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 common turn or like the it was to drive the Soviets away from China, wasn't it? Well, this... yeah, but I think it was kind of on both sides. I mean, it takes two to tango. And, you know, in the in the 40s, you know, Mao visited uh, Moscow and he spent two months there and they were just like buddy, buddy. And there, there was like clear collaboration and, you know, every relationship sours and... 30 years later, it seemed kind of possible for there to be an opening. But that opening that Nixon and Kissinger laid, which was kind of splitting the communist bloc and, and so on, it, it eventuated 25 years after that in the Chimerica relationship where you had this like, you know, communism with Chinese characteristics, which was a, a certain kind of capitalism that, you know, might, has some aspects to it that we could admire, but, um, you know, it, it, it is a, it is just a massive geopolitical move, but it takes two to tango. I mean, it wasn't just the West, like going in there. I mean, I think Mao was, you know, eager and willing to do it. I have, uh, but, okay. Last one. Okay. I'm okay, cool. Uh, I was listening to your debate with Haas and one of the things you brought up is like, sort of with Yugoslavia, but, you know, like, you know, uh, Latin America and the third world, there was, the Cold War wasn't a completely bifurcated system, although it, in many ways, inevitably, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, you could kind of argue that, would it be fair to say that this has kind of shown the Cold War has never really ended? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't... It... I, I think there, I mean, it did end, obviously, and I, and I think there, you know, it's fair to say that the 30 year period after the 89 91 situation was a kind of unipolar moment, a globalization yep. moment, whatever. I mean, that's fair to say, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's like we're, it's, it's more natural for their bifurcation just kind of works. It's more natural for there to be conflict and for there to be, antagonism and so uh you know it, it's like that that was a default way and i i think probably in the security state they never exactly <laughs> viewed russia as like oh we're all you know it's just like finland now or something i don't you know so yeah. i i do i do think it's also kind of fair to say that the Cold War never really ended. And yeah. certainly by, by the Obama era, I mean, Obama, as we look back on him now, Obama almost seems like a like restrained Republican president. You mm -hmm. know, he, he didn't, you know, Russian-American relations almost improved after the strike on Georgia. And with Crimea, I mean, he was not, there were, no, there were nothing, nothing like what we just saw, like, uh, you know, with these sanctions. I mean, there were, there was no, My little there green was man. a response, yeah. <laughs> it was a response, but, yeah. but it, it was a kind of like, I think Obama's Obama was kind of influenced by the anti-war left and right. And mm -hmm. he did kind of, I mean, again, his first term aside, I mean, I, you know, that, you know, the, the Libya and all that kind of stuff that I don't think his heart was fully in that. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, you had people like Samantha Power stressing humanitarian intervention. I think, I, think, I mean, it's kind of weird, I guess, to say this, but I... He did cozy Obama, up to Cuba, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was not... Obama, again, he, he existed in a certain time. You can't, like, you know, how would he react if he were president now? He probably would be doing the same thing that Biden yeah. is. But, but he, in that time, there was a kind of, like, hangover after the Iraq war. And there was a, I, I think he was open to not getting into a cold war antagonism with Russia. And that might have kind of related back to his leftism in his yeah. youth, where mm-hmm. they viewed the cold war as this like, you know, trick pulled off by whites or whatever, yeah. you know? And so I don't know. I, I kind of, I'm kind of a Obama revisionist, you could say. Yeah, the, the reset button with his early administration. You could kind of compare yeah. him to Biden because it was kind of almost similar, like all the way up to pretty much a month ago. It yeah. was pretty much the, the same thing. There was a reset button, an attempt to reproach, and then that kind of fell apart. <laughs> yeah, well, remember, Biden, and I, I can look up the exact facts of this, Biden reduced sanctions on the North Stream that were present in the set last two years of Trump. He was also reducing sanctions on Venezuela too. Yeah. So yeah. in this weird way, like Trump in 2016, Trump was, I think just overtly pro Russia. Like you had mm-hmm. Manafort as his campaign manager. They were changing the RNC, uh, you know, they um, wanted to leave agenda. NATO. <laughs> yeah. And, and Trump wanted to leave NATO in his own like weird way where he's like, you know, why isn't Germany paying me? It's like the larger <laughs> EU. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and so, so it, it's like, but, but you could say he was pro Russia. Now after, I do think that Russia gate had an effect. I mean, I think there was a kind of sense of like, we've got to, we've got to prove how not a Russian, you know, stooge I am. So we're going to, you know, do these sanctions um, you know, there were these kind of weird moments where, like, um, you know, tr- Trump was like trusting Russian w- Putin's word on the did we hack the elections? Well, I think Ukraine did. And then in the, the whole impeachment of 2019, which has been like largely forgotten, that was this weird, this very Trumpian move where he 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 took like an energy of 2016 and then turned it into this like utterly self-serving thing so yeah and that's kind of to Zelensky himself Mm -hmm. and was like hey man we we might hold up aid on you unless you give me the goods on this guy who's running against me it was like a weird way to kind of (laughs) well yeah yeah Yeah, it was like like Zelensky in like a a mm -hmm. basic sense but it was just like totally self I remember because a lot of this you know you got to think about how all this lines up it's like early 2019 I kind of paid attention to the Ukrainian election and I mean I will say this and repeat it I mean Zelensky was repeated similarly to Trump as a pro-Russian candidate over the I mean it's everyone's like oh wow this guy has a certain background and you know he's like all liberal it's like well the previous Poroshenko guy, whatever you think of him, was the conservative. He was the right wing yeah. guy. Um, and then it's like twisted where like even now he's like he's the one going on CNN or whatever. He's like, oh, yes, I have my Kalashnikov right here. Oh, I'm fighting. Like, <laughs> um, but um, like, you know, Zelensky, you know, he's a libertarian. And it's like, oh, well, that was kind of like with Trump. <laughs> you know, well, Trump wasn't he was like a libertarian nationalist. <laughs> you know, I, that's kind of mm-hmm. what repelled me about him in 2016. Um, mm. but, um, to, to get to the point with the, uh, with the impeachment trial, that was almost a transition point. Cause I remember, you know, following stuff like Fort Roos news or whatever, you know, pro Russian outlets were putting out and they were saying like, Oh dude, the Demo- the Ukrainian supported the Democrats, you know, <laughs> like, um, that was like the first, that was the first time I heard the term Ukraine gate. And mm-hmm. then, um, and, and that's like the thing with Zelensky, it's like, you know, Zelensky said like, oh, uh, it went well with Trump. So all the Trump pro Trump people are saying like, yeah, we like Zelensky. And then the Democrats sort of see, oh, Trump pressured Zelensky. So they so they're sympathetic to Zelensky. So you can mm-hmm. kind of see how that creates the, the kind of bipartisan consensus on that issue. But also that impeachment 
happened like on 2020, like that happened right as the election and COVID started. And that's just kind of like where you could say, like it just transitioned from, I mean, 2016 Trump was kind of dying over, you know, the, the three years. Um, but it really changed. You could argue at that point at that impeachment, like right after that is when you could say things began, the, the gears began to move to, you know, the next chapter of 2022 and, um, you know, we're kind of just continuing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, the, the, yeah, it was. All right, guys. Yeah, I've done cool. Three hours. Nice talking. Woo. Yeah. Got a little hot under the collar a few times. Could I, could I ask a quick question? Real Spencer temper rears its head. Yeah, real quick. Um, Zelensky has been going, uh, talking to different parliaments in the world, showing them hypothetical images of their capitals under attack. And I was actually pondering, like, let's say Canada got very far left uh, politically and America felt threatened by that. Do you think there, there really is a real world uh, where there is, really is a world, a real timeline where America invades and let's say annexes Canada because they they deem them too far communist or too far left and it's a secu- security concern. Would you agree with that assessment? No. No? Okay. Well, I, this is just a bizarre hypothetical. I mean, I... Well, it I is. Mean, it's not meant to be real. It's just... It's a, a, It's an extreme hypothetical. It's because it's just as Russia invaded Ukraine, I think there is a real timeline where the U.S. could do this to Canada. But I don't think... I don't expect to, it to happen. But, to denazify but right. Canada? No, not denazify. Uh, to <laughs> decommunize. I think it would be to decommunize. No, That's what I they think it's say. the other way around. We should invade uh, Canada to uh, kick out the, the British monarchy there. Like, they still own all the land up okay. there, technically. Okay. On that note, uh, goodbye, everyone. Uh, no, I don't think that's ever happening in any timeline. Uh, um, okay, can, can I just ask, Marvel ask one last thing? Multiverse. Thanks. Uh, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping it up. You're just trying to get the last word. Okay. Um, uh... Um, yes, um, because uh, you, uh, we all know that uh, um, Hungary has interest in uh, Ukraine because the minorities mistreated there. And Poland, they have actually just, I think it was five years ago, they recognized uh, the actions of the Banderites during the Second World War as uh, a genocide. So do you think we're going to see a more tension there between Poland and Hungary and uh, Ukraine? Because I don't think they are completely on board with the, uh, with the whole they uh, NATO are stuff. Board. I mean, Orban got, uh, got on board very quickly. It was remarkable. I mean, um, Salvini also got on board, um, although he's not in power in Italy, but he he did not do the Tucker Carlson route. Trump has gotten on board, although it's it's not very plausible. But Orban, like, I don't think there's any real tension whatsoever. I mean, they, um, he, Orban's a pragmatist. He's with NATO. I don't think, I don't see any, any issue. Anyway, guys, I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.